Well, hello, my favorite people. Can everybody hear me? Say hello, type some comments so I know you guys are here. Um, also, when you type, uh, type what country you're watching from and what time is over there. I have noon, actually 12.30 here in uh, Michigan, Eastern Standard Time, same time as New York. Um, everybody who wants to say hello and now let me know that you can see me, type some comments. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome. If you're watching on Facebook, welcome. Uh, today we have exciting interview that I would like to um, introduce you to. So as you guys are typing and, and letting me know from what countries you're watching and now what time is over there, I will be um, answering some of your comments later. Um, and I would like to uh, get some um, get some of your comments first before I get started. So let's see. We have some hellos. We got... Fabian, hello. Fabian, what country are you watching from? Guys, everybody who's joined the stream, uh, when you type hellos and uh, type from what country and what time is over there where you're at. We have William saying hello, good people. Hello, William. We have Vibiki says hi from Hopin Copenhagen, Denmark. 6 30 p.m. there. I'm sorry. I'm always trying to say German, Zex, right? Um, Vibike, hello down there, Copenhagen. It's wonderful. So we have a huge time difference. You see, guys, we have noon and uh, Europe already has evening. So we have here greetings from Alaska, USA, almost 8 30 a.m. Kevin, welcome. We have Marianne, hello from Denmark. Wonderful. We have Andreas from Sweden. Mountains, beautiful. Everybody type your country and what time um, is over there where you guys are watching from. We have Prague, beautiful Mari and Nedlikov. Wonderful, 6.24 p.m. Super. You guys keep typing um, every country you're watching from. Hello from Ireland. I love it. Did I miss New York? Here we go, Fabian from New York. Wonderful. Um, let me see. I have Adam from Australia, 4 a.m. Wow, you guys are 4 a.m. And you are not asleep watching our live stream. What a nice guy. Thank you so much. Again, uh, make, make sure I didn't... Uh, miss anybody we have Mohammed from Sri Lanka I love it we have Moktamir hello Malaysian 1 30 a.m beautiful so we have hello how are you doing there I'm watching from Mozambique time there is 7 24 p.m excellent does that mean we have time difference in minutes uh, beautiful guys we have Australia Adam, let's see. I think I have UK. Oh, no, I have Malaysia. Excellent. Again, I think I got everybody. We have Atlanta. Perfect. United States. CJ, welcome. We have Tommy from Italy, 6.30 p.m. Beautiful. Italy, welcome. Well, we have Williams. East, um, wait, a, wait a minute. Do I say Earth, Oklahoma? <laughs> Perfect. Cold here. Well, it's cold here too, guys. It's snowing as we speak. And uh, we have a blizzard. Uh, basically, blizzard was last night Last night as well. Uh, did I miss everybody? Oh, gosh, I got more comments. Brisbane says, Jared, gorgeous. I love it. William said, 11.25 a.m. Um, Madhu says, hello from Sierra Leone. I love it. Watching you from Germany, says Ansu. Perfect. We have hello from Holland. I love it. I worked with the people from your country, the wonderful people. I think I worked just with, about, uh, with people from every country in the world uh, in my career overseas. Austria in the house. Yes, Austria. Are you going to supply more weapons to Ukraine, Austria? Are you holding your elected officials accountable? 
don't worry, we can't hold ours accountable either. We have Albert. Good afternoon. I got to go to sleep for work tonight. Albert, you get to go to sleep tonight. Welcome. You're watching on, uh, on YouTube. Everybody watching on Facebook, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Make sure you do that. Um, let me see who did I miss real quick. Beautiful, big Irish. Welcome to you, says Michael Walsh. Our time is 5.25 p.m. Keep up, keep up the good work. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Welcome. The time is now for all of us. Excellent comment. Where are you? I'm in Michigan, USA. Yes, that's why I usually like to say USA, USA, so we could at least wake up. No pun intended. We have Arizona in the house. Beautiful, Deanna. Okay, guys. Excellent. Start uh, typing your comments where you watching from. We have Seattle. Beautiful. Raphael. Everybody type where you're watching from and what country and what time is it there, and I will begin. Um, today, I have a wonderful interview to present to you. It's going to be labor intensive because I will be translating it to you. Remember how I like to bring you different perspectives. Of course, you know that I am from Ukraine. I'm American citizen. I'm fluent in both Ukrainian and Russian. So I have a unique ability to converse with people from all sides of the spectrum. Um, you know, I have some interviews with Scott Reader. I have an interview on my channel with Alexander Skupchenko. He was kind uh, to get together with me and we recorded an interview. And he basically uh, called Joe Biden, in his view, as a Ukrainian citizen, a criminal. That's how Ukrainian people feel about us, America, and our government. And our government and our media keeps telling that, oh, everything is just fine. Biden is just perfect. And Zelensky is, uh, you know, basically almost like the, uh, the messiah that, that walked from the cloud and landed on us. Whatever he says, we have to all bow to him and do everything he wants. Um, and, and then on the other hand, we have all these people who are from Ukraine, like the gentleman I'm going to present to you today, whose name is Rostislav Ischenko. And he understands what is happening to Ukraine from the perspective who lived there who actually served under one of Ukrainian president's administrations in the past is a diplomat. So I'm proudly presenting to you Rostislav Ishenko. I will be translating it live for you so you will get an idea, firsthand exclusive interview. What is the man who lived in Ukraine and worked even for the presidential office of Ukraine in the past? Uh, thinks uh, about the situation between United States, Russia, and Ukraine, what happened in Ukraine in 2014. And also, he's uh, going to comment about Germany and Poland. Uh, you will see the uh, questions that I ask him. He's now a geopolitical analyst. He moved to Russia. My understanding, after the coup, he moved to Russia, but don't quote me on that. I didn't go into personal details with Rostislav. I pretty much asked him um, the opinions and the questions, and that was pretty much it. So all I know that he has very stellar career as a diplomat and currently even contributes to RT. I believe to Russia today. I think that's what he said in his introduction. He writes articles. He speaks in extensively on the subject of Ukraine, geopolitics, um, and he is a frequent guest on the top channels. He used, used to be in Ukraine when he lived there, but now in Russia, since he lives in Russia. So everybody, thankfully, um, uh, William says, I hope you're not uh, near to those poisonous clouds. Yeah, we have the, the spill in Ohio. Did you guys all know about it? I don't know. Michigan is not that far away. Adam says, uh, they should too. USA is sending depleted uranium uh, rounds to be used in Ukraine, which will uh, cause cancers and birth defects for many years to come. And if they truly care about Ukrainians, they would not send them those rounds. Yeah, looks like that's what they're doing. 
Russell Tex doing okay? Um, I actually, he did email me. We're trying to get together when his time allows. I hope that he's doing okay. I got an email from him a couple of days back. So we'll see when we can coordinate the next one. We'll get uh, together with him too. Um, let me see. I think I got everybody's comment. Um, how is your opinion about German um, HRH seeking new gas supply with our Petronas local Malaysian company? Good question. Let's get with the interview. But I do know that this war in Ukraine is basically also about resources, gas and oil, um, removing Russia from global market. But I don't think it's working all that well. I know Turkey now is becoming a new hub for gas deliveries in Europe uh, because uh, Putin invited Erdogan after Nord Stream was blown up by you know who, right? No, we can guess, and uh, Seymour Hersh uh, hinted uh, that United States and directly Biden is possibly uh, given order to destroy Nord Stream. But after that, Mr. Putin approached Erdogan, and now Turkey is going to uh, become the, uh, they build a new pipeline, and Turkey is going to become the energy supplier for Europe. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see what happens with Malaysia. I do know that Italy was looking for alternative to Russian gas. I almost think that they've signed some agreements with Angola. Don't quote me on that, but you guys can Google that up. Really quickly, a couple of more comments. Everybody who's watching, we're about to do the interview. President Biden and his administration must go to prison for their acts of terrorism. Uh, you're right. It's definitely an act of terrorism to blow up uh, infrastructure like this. And on top of it, our ally, Germany, it's like a declaration of war. Are we at war with Germany, United States, Mr. Biden? Are we at war with our allies? Are we insane? It's unbelievable, guys, what's happening. Um, I think I got this one. I got Biden. We have Terminal Junior says Western countries should stop lying and continue to pump weapons to Ukraine. Zelensky should stop also provoking more problems then uh, come into his senses and start talking to Vladimir Putin to stop the war which is killing innocent people. I agree with you, but Zelensky uh, signed agreement with himself that he is not going to negotiate or talk to Putin. Uh, he did um, actually, it, it's sort of like a law now he, he made with himself in Ukraine. And when the media asked him uh, to comment on this, he said, oh, I will talk to the president of Russia, but it will be a different president of Russia. Hint, hint, meaning not Putin, meaning Putin has to go, right? Um, we have a great comment watching from California, United States, welcome. Everybody type your comments, like, share, subscribe to this channel, like the stream, push those like buttons like crazy, push, 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 so more people can see our stream and hopefully that YouTube algorithm will push it out to more people. Share the links to your social media so everybody could join us. This interview is wonderful that I have for you. Um, real quick, America is corrupt. Yep, unfortunately so. Howard says Biden and his administration are war criminals, echo terrorism. You're right, it's uh, industrial terrorism. I mean, there is a lot, there are lots of terms, especially Eco-terrorism, uh, you probably mean that all that um, a gas, a gas and the methane, a methane gas, a gas escaped into the uh, air, into the sea. Yeah, I think that spill was worse than uh, all these Greenpeace activist guys uh, always uh, screaming around how dangerous the methane, methane gas is and let's kill the cows and let's not eat meat. I mean, seriously. That uh, Nord Stream pipeline, uh, I think I read somewhere, put... Uh, more methane into the atmosphere than uh, all of those concerns. We have Philippines. Excellent, Cora. Welcome, Philippines. We need to call a ceasefire and a truce, says William Garrison. Yep, we need, but Washington is not going to call ceasefire. By the way, Biden is going to go to Poland next week. Today, President Putin is meeting with uh, President of Belarus, B Lukashenko. And you know, Russia and Belarus have uh, a mutual agreement regarding their armed forces. 
And of course, a lot of people are anticipating that maybe Belarus will get involved into the war, even though Lukashenko had said many times has no intention uh, in uh, getting involved. But uh, we'll see what they say. These two presidents meet today, I believe. And then President Vladimir Putin next week is going to meet on Tuesday, um, I believe, uh, give a speech rather. And that speech everybody is expecting because, you know, the anniversary is approaching of the uh, beginning of this war, anniversary in quote, uh, quotation marks. Uh, this is actually a quote from Lindsey Graham, who said yesterday that we United States are going to designate Wagner Group as the terrorist organizations um, and we need to do more because they are bad and they're this and that and they're criminals. So we have bipartisan support and we need to do it to this anniversary of this war. I'm thinking, what? You are celebrating this war now? Instead of saying, call for peace, this is insane. It's been going on for a year. No. American Senator Lindsey Graham says, and then there was a Republican. He is a Republican senator, but there was also a Democratic senator. I think Chris Murphy next to him. Uh, I watched it on CNN live. And he goes, oh, it's an anniversary and we need to do something for the anniversary. So let's recognize Wagner as a terrorist group and, and do something more than other than resolution. These people are insane. They're celebrating the anniversary of the bloodiest conflict in Europe since World War II. So, yeah, so going back to Putin, he's going to have some type of a um, very memorial speech, I guess, a hallmark speech next Tuesday. And then on Wednesday... Um, I believe uh, Russian Security Council is going to meet. So they will be addressing something. And Biden, I believe, will be in Poland. So it's going to be a major, major uh, event. So, okay, guys, in, enough of little brief hellos. Watching from Zambia, beautiful. Robert says, um, and we have perfect. Is this just Biden and the Americans... There's multiple individuals in multiple countries. There is a group of criminals, William says. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that politicians uh, in just about every country sold out their people. Look at Europe, what they do. Germany gets attacked by United States and not a peep from German uh, uh, politicians. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Who did I see? Graham is the psycho, says CJ. I'm, I think that you're right. Um... We have another comment real quick from Netherlands. David says 42 viewers on Facebook and only zero viewers on the YouTube. No, that's not a zero viewers. We have Oli right here or Obi and there will be more, I'm sure. So you guys don't forget, um, we have different platforms and it's not the same time in every country right now. So like uh, the guys who are typing here, Somebody has a night, somebody has 4 a.m., somebody has 1 a.m. So whoever can uh, catch my live, great. If not, uh, watch it later again. So let's start. Here's the interview. I will play it, guys, and I will translate it. And we have a wonderful interview with Rostislav Ishenko. Again, he is a former Ukrainian diplomat. He worked for one of the presidents um, of Ukraine. And he also uh, currently lives in Russia. My understanding, he left after the coup. And he contributes to a uh, lots of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, outlets in Russia, the news media. He is a frequent guest on television. And um, he's sought after to hear his opinion. Here's my interview with him and uh, what he had to say about Zelensky and about Ukraine, what happened in Ukraine. Um, the sound on his side was not all that perfect. So guys, bear with us. But I will try to do my best to translate it live for you so you get an idea of uh, what I ask and what Rostislav answers to me. A perspective from somebody who is Ukrainian but now moved to Russia, obviously does not agree with current uh, Ukrainian uh, policies um, as he is a commentator uh, currently for Russia Today and uh, Russian news media. Um, 
Here it is. Let's listen in. Группы Россия сегодня. Ростислав Ищенко. Ростислав из бывший дипломат. Он работал в администрации одного из предыдущих президентов Украины. Ростислав сейчас находится в России и занимается обширной деятельностью, комментирует и пишет статьи, его приглашают на различные программы. И он комментирует ситуацию в Украине, геополитическую ситуацию в мире. Так что это мое большое... Моя большая привилегия предоставить вам Ростислава Ищенко сегодня. Ростислав, здравствуйте. I introduced Rostislav pretty much what I just told you guys that he's a, a former diplomat, worked for one of Ukrainian presidents in the past, and currently a geopolitical analyst in uh, Russia, where he lives and resides, and he is a frequent commentator on Russia Today, contributor there, and uh, speaks at various Russian TV. Uh, geopolitical shows with his analysis on the current situation in Ukraine and around the world. Hello, I'm glad to see you, Rostislav tells me. Thank you, I say. So, so do you. Nice to see you too. Прокомментируйте, пожалуйста, Ростислав, что произошло в Украине в 2014 году для... I'm asking Rostislav to comment what happened in Ukraine in 2014 for American American audience. У нас информационный голод. Наши СМИ нам врут уже на протяжении всех. I am saying to um, to Rostislav that we have information hunger here in the United States that our media lies to us uh, during all these different years. And uh, the media uh, tells us basically what uh, that Putin is evil, that Russia is aggressor. And I'm asking him to comment on what is in his uh, opinion that happened in uh, 2014 in Ukraine. Because our media tells us that it's Putin who is behind the coup in Ukraine in 2014. It's Putin who started this war. It's Russia that's aggressor. So I'm asking him, what do you think happened in Ukraine? Was Putin really behind it? And who is behind all that is happening in Ukraine, including the coup of 2014? Here's what Rostislav has to say. Listen in. Этих лет говорят о том, что во всем виноват Путин, Россия агрессор, и что революция Майдан в 2014 году это все Путин, это все он создал. Как вы прокомментируете, как произошла война на Украине и что произошло в 2014 году, когда произошел государственный переворот? Кто за этим стоял, как вы думаете? Ну, видите, на Украине. Государственный переворот в 2014 году был уже третьим по счету. He says to me in in response to my question about what happened in Ukraine in 2014 and who's behind it. He says the coup that happened in Ukraine in 2014 was already the third attempt, the third attempted coup in Ukraine. Первым был государственный переворот в четвертом пятом году. The first one was in 2004 and 2005 about. Значит, в ноябре 4 января 5 года. Значит, вторым был государственный переворот. And it happened about in January of 2005. В 2007 году, когда... Second coup took place in 2007. Ющенко распустил парламент. When Yushchenko, the, uh, one of the presidents of Ukraine, disbanded the Ukrainian parliament. Незаконно. Illegally. И разогнал правительство Януковича. And he basically disbanded, disbanded the government of Yanukovych at that time. Значит, он не имел полномочий. Which he didn't have any right to do, meaning Yushchenko had no right to do. И, наконец, 2014 год, это последний государственный. And, of course, the latest coup in Ukraine of 2014, it's the latest one. Была еще попытка государственного переворота в 2000-2002 году. There was also attempt to change the regime of Ukraine and assert the coup in about 2002, I believe he says. Так называемая акция Украины без кучмы. 
this was called action uh, Ukraine without Kuchma. Kuchma was, I believe, at that time a president of Ukraine. No, тогда власть устояла. But then the power actually held on, and so that Это didn't happen. Раз, когда Майдан на Украине начался, но ничем не закончился. This was the only time, Rostislav says, when the coup, the, the protests, uh, basically the regime change in Ukraine started, but did not uh, uh, come to fruition back then, in 2002-ish, I think that's what he mentions. So we have major three Ukrainian regime change slash coups in Ukraine to date. Во всех трех случаях к власти приходят люди, ориентированные на Соединенные Штаты. In all three instances, the people who come to power in Ukraine as a result of these coups are people who are oriented strictly onto United States, meaning in favor and orient their policies looking favorably to the United States. So I think, Rostislav says, it's very obvious who is behind it. Putin сильно напрягался для того, чтобы приводить к власти на Украине американских ставлений. I don't think uh, that Putin would uh, put his efforts into bringing into power in Ukraine those who are pro-American and those who support American policies, Rostislav says. In other words, that was sarcasm. He was basically saying that as a result of all these coups, pro-American coup government comes to power in Ukraine. So we understand who is behind it. And obviously it's not Putin because Putin has no interest in bringing pro-American government to power in Ukraine. He is now detailing all the other presidents of the Ukraine previous to Zelensky. He's saying that even those politicians, those former presidents of Ukraine like Kuchma and Yanukovych, Against both of those, they were attempted coups. Um, Kuchma in 2001 and 2, Yanukovych in, um, in 2004, 5, I think he also said in 2007, um, something along those lines, and the latest one in 2014. So, those, um, all those leaders, he is saying, basically. They were not particularly pro-Russian presidents. They were sort of, you know, oriented to the West as well in some ways. Но они исходили из необходимости защиты национальных экономических интересов Украины. But they also, those presidents, were trying to protect while looking at the West, yet protect economical interests of Ukraine at the time. And so they could protect national businesses of Ukraine. Они исходили из того, что интересы национального бизнеса должны быть защищены, и что у Украины есть определенные государственные интересы, которые не всегда совпадают с государственными интересами Соединенных Штатов. And so those presidents, even though they seemed to be somewhat pro-Western, the ones uh, against whom the coups were sponsored, right? They still believed that uh, Ukrainian national businesses should be protected, but they realized that uh, Ukrainian national interests are not always uh, in uh, alignment with American uh, pot potentially economical or national interests. And also with other countries, France, or Germany, possibly. And not even those Ukrainian national interests are always in line in, uh, with Russia as well. So Kuchma and Yanukovych were those presidents against whom the coups were sponsored and um, attempted. 
they basically uh, provided the policies and they were taking the course of policies for Ukraine, what they call multi-directional, meaning we're going to look to the West, but then we don't want to break ties with Russia because we want to protect our economical interests. We have ties with Russia, but yet if, if we want to go into EU, we want to be able to do that. So those two presidents uh, against whom the coups were attempted, uh, they were trying to, uh, if I put it in in uh, in plain, uh, I guess, layman's terms, would be sit on all chairs, right? So they're trying to be friendly to the West and friendly to Russia, uh, because obviously they had a lot of ties with, with both sides. So listen in, Rostislav continues. Когда политическая интеграция в структуры ЕС, а в перспективе даже и НАТО, значит, рассматривалась параллельно с возможностью экономического сотрудничества с Россией, поскольку вся украинская экономика, по сути дела, была завязана на российский рынок, была завязана на российскую экономику. He's basically saying that those politicians, those presidents, basically, they had to look uh, to have some type of ties and relations with Russia as well as the West, because the Ukrainian economy, you know, Ukraine and Russia used to be a part of Soviet Union. Uh, they used to be part of 15 republics of former Soviet Union, right? So the economy in Russia uh, and Ukraine economies were very closely tied and could join together. So Rostislav is saying that those Ukrainian presidents um, basically were, provide, were promoting this multi-directional policy where they were trying to do be, be friendly with the West and possibly join the EU or look at the EU as a possibility for Ukraine, but yet didn't want to sever ties with Russia because uh, the economical interests of Ukraine were closely tied with Russia, the trade and, and so forth. И без экономического сотрудничества с Россией Украина просто стала снищена государством. And without ties with Russia and economical cooperation with Russia, Ukraine would become a bankrupt, um, non-viable state, says Rostislav. Так вот эта позиция, несмотря на то, что она была более прозападной, чем пророссийской, и которая совершенно не удовлетворяла, кстати, Россию, она тем более не удовлетворяла Америку. Но если Россия пыталась с Украиной как-то договориться, предложить там, более выгодные условия экономического сотрудничества, предложить какие-то крупные кредиты, предложить интересные э, условия... And he says this multi-directional policy of those Ukrainian presidents were not really something that uh, America and United States were thrilled about, and uh, neither was Russia. And he says if Russia was trying to actually cooperate with Ukraine economically, provide different potential organizations, the, the venues, the avenues for cooperation, and to continue some of these relations as, as far as economical relations between Russia and Ukraine and tried to sort of do diplomacy to continue relations between Russia and Ukraine. He says United States just came and changed the power and changed the regime and got it over with. And as was without offering any type of diplomatic cooperative solutions via some organizations, new framework. No, he says Russia was offering that uh, as part of cooperation with also Belarus and Kazakhstan, uh, some of the former Soviet Union Republic. But uh, all United States did, he said, is just came in and uh, changed the power in Ukraine. They basically changed the regime in Ukraine. And he says they started to feed into this nationalistic element of Ukraine and they brought to power those people who are basically marauders 
who do not care the Ukrainian uh, people in power now whether Ukraine will exist or not. What what kind of country Ukraine will become? Because their salary is built uh, basically on just taking orders from Washington. So United States uh, brought people to power, Rostislav says, a uh, former Ukrainian diplomat who now lives in Russia, who you watch on your screen with me um, in the interview. He basically says United States brought the people to power who do not care about Ukraine or what Ukraine will look like or what about people of Ukraine. And all these people want is the, the, this basically a puppet government of Ukraine is the Washington to keep sending money so they could keep stealing the money and they will take orders and do whatever they are told. Именно поэтому практически все проамериканские правительства Украины, начиная с 14 -го года, заканчивают тем, что американская пресса начинает писать о жуткой коррупции на Украине, значит, о том, как там воруют и так далее. Но э, воровать их научили Соединенные Штаты. И он говорит, и это почему с 2014 uh, just about every American news outlet is publishing the article about oh, corruption in Ukraine, terrible corruption in Ukraine. But Rostislav says, who taught them to be corrupt? He says, it's United States who taught Ukrainian politicians to be corrupt. They taught them corruption, he says. They gave them money and they give them money, meaning Americans, give money to Ukrainians. So, principle, and this money is given to Ukrainian politicians by American politicians with a caveat. You can steal as much as you want as soon as you are promoting anti-Russian policies. И сейчас Соединенные Штаты прекрасно знают, что и украинские политики, и украинские генералы воруют американскую помощь, то есть финансовую помощь, разворовывают в огромных количествах. He says, so now everybody knows that Ukrainian politicians and Ukrainian army men, meaning the top commanders, of course, we have to always say not all, some, right? Um, are basically, and, and politicians and type, uh, top officials uh, says Rostislav, uh, are basically stealing the aid that comes to Ukraine and the money that goes to Ukraine. And by the way, it's not a hearsay, guys. Check out uh, about a week ago, I think Zelensky removed five governors or six governors, and they had anti-corruption uh, agency knocking on the doors of just about every other top politician in Ukraine. And of course, interior minister died and was top other nine officials in a mysterious helicopter crash. So yeah, Rostislav says that uh, basically the money that comes to Ukraine is being uh, stolen, but American politicians tell Ukrainian politicians that um, the caveat on receiving the money, steal as much as you want, as soon as you promote anti-Russian policies, we'll give you more. Но для Америки важно, чтобы Украина продолжала войну с Россией, потому что Соединенные Штаты заявили своей целью, официально заявили своей целью уничтожение российского государства. For America is important for Ukraine to keep fighting with Russia because America, says Lorstislav, officially basically declared that they are at war with Russia. И избрали в качестве метода уничтожения российского государства. And they um, declared that they want to destroy Russian state and as a method of destruction of Russia is going to be the war, the lingering war uh, to the total annihilation, to the total exhaustion. Meaning the lingering war is the method with which United States is trying to fight Russia. Basically exhaustion, the war of exha exhaustion, exhaust Russia of everything that uh, the, the war is lingering and uh, creates more hardship and uh, Russia is just getting exhausted.
кто угодно, он, сейчас, по крайней мере, Украина. Закончится Украина, надо будет найти кого-нибудь другого, например. And they're doing it uh, with Ukraine's hands. For right now, they have Ukraine. They're doing it with Ukraine. If Ukraine will be no more, they'll find somebody else, some other proxy willing to do that to Russia. And they might uh, actually sign up Poland to uh, go and fight Russia. And the uh, United States will be supplying weapons and financing all of that operation. Ну и понятно, что политики, которые э, принимают подобного рода условия, да, которые практически предают интересы собственного государства, которые делают из Украины механизм американского воздействия на Россию, которые фактически уничтожают Украину, собственное государство, американских интересов ради того, чтобы просто досадить каким-то образом, создать трудности для России. Понятно, что они будут все это делать не бесплатно. And uh, Rostislav says, of course, the politicians of Ukraine who are going to create hardships for Russia via creating all this proxy conflict with Russia and fighting Russia, they're not going to do it for free. And Ukrainian politicians, the corrupt politicians of Ukraine, are looking at the America's money that America provides and the, the foreign aid that America sends to Ukraine as uh, some type of compensation for their hard work against Russia. And basically, hard work for services rendered. So this is a really huge and hard and uh, well-oiled uh, corruption mechanism, a corrupt operation, says Rostislav. Inside the country of Ukraine, the totalitarian regime has been created and totalitarian government is in place and uh, installed in Ukraine right now. Зеленский закрыл практически все оппозиционные партии. По-моему, шесть или семь партий он запретил. Зеленский forbid and he closed all the opposition parties, says Rostislav. In uh, about six or seven of them only in 2022. And of course, I read the other day that I think it was even 11 or 12 now. Uh, so Zelensky banned all the opposition parties. Um, says Rostislav, and uh, basically the government they, is totalitarian dictatorship. Zelensky also destroyed all opposition media, opposition uh, newspapers. Значит, если что-то и работает в украинском информационном пространстве оппозиционного, то работает оно из-за границы, как например. Even if there is anything that's in opposition to Zelensky in some type of shape or form in that exists in the media, uh, sort of uh, on the waves, right, on the media waves, uh, he says those people operate from abroad because they are in danger. And he gives an example of one media channel who is actually pro-Ukrainian but criticizes Zelensky and his policy. But even they have to operate from abroad because they fear for their life. That uh, news outlet that Rostislav says is uh, weekly, uh, a country UA weekly. Um, that he says that they have to be operating from abroad, even though they are pro-Ukrainian channel, only they just don't approve of certain policies of Zelensky. But for the fear of their life, even they had to move outside Ukraine to be able to say something without, uh, uh, because they're banned. Uh, Zelensky banned all independent media and opposition media. Zelensky 
на украинской территории для них просто опасно. Это самое относится к другим средствам массовой информации. То есть это, ну, стоп. Rostislav basically says all the other media outlets and channels are in the same position, that they are afraid and they are being banned. So they either have to move outside Ukraine if they want to continue speaking out or you cannot um, do anything that possibly does not agree with the landscape or whatever policies that he wants to promote inside Ukraine. Rostislav says it's basically a classical um, pro-American Latin uh, type Latin type country uh, dictatorship, um, Latin Latin American pro uh, pro American dictatorship style. Перенесенная на европейский континент и вместо торговли наркотиками основным источником их прибыли является война против России. So instead of uh, them being, let's say, Latin American country that's involved in a drug trafficking, um, pro-American uh, type, uh, he says, uh, we just basically have the same dictatorship um, style transferred onto European soil and uh, revived and uh, reversed in Ukraine, he says. Вот это, собственно, то, что в 2014 году было сделано с Украиной. And that's what happened in Ukraine in 2014. That's what they did to Ukraine. Я, кстати, даже не думаю, что это в конечном итоге соответствует интересам Соединенных Штатов как государства. Это соответствует интересам отдельных групп политиков, значит, американских, которые фактически обанкротили запугиванием Китаем, американцев там, и так далее. А для этого им необходимы войны значит, на Россию, на Трагилию, Украину, на Китай. He's basically saying that American government just um, um, has a lot of internal problems. And in order to distract people from the problems that exist within the United States, um, they just starting to pick these wars with these different countries. They want to um, have China and uh, Taiwan be at war. They want to have Russia um, in Ukraine. And they threw Ukraine at Russia into this conflict. Пытаясь натравить Тайвань и так далее, для того, чтобы продемонстрировать вот эти якобы ужасные агрессивные сущности, которые, находясь на другом конце планеты, каким-то образом угрожают Соединенным Штатам. Для того, чтобы люди просто не спрашивали, а почему... And they actually want to villainize uh, the other countries, like China and Russia, basically, uh, to make them into villains, in order to divert the attention of American population from asking questions. Why are we not living as good anymore as we used to live before? In the United States, the situation has greatly improved in the past 20 years. Why do people become significantly worse in the United States? In the United States, says Rostislav, people are not living as well. The standard of living is down since the last decade. And uh, he says uh, American people will ask questions. В России за последние два десятилетия люди стали жить значительно лучше. And people in Russia in the last two decades, um, unlike American people, are actually living better, says Rostislav. В России динамика развития позитивная, уровень жизни постоянно растет, даже несмотря на то, что последние годы, даже я сказал последние десятилетия. Россия практически находится в состоянии необъявленной войны с Западом. He says um, Russia has been sort of painted as a as the um, um, as a force to be uh, to be reckoned with and uh, to subside, right? To subdue. He said by uh, the Western by the West in, um, in the last many decades. So basically, he says the West is at war with Russia even though they don't uh, come out and, uh, you know, declare it. But de facto, the West is at war with Russia. The pressure on Russia, financially, economical pressure on Russia, 
uh, obviously the sanctions and all of these other methods that the West is using against Russia basically is um, constituting a war type situation. And uh, the war is against Russia. Пытаются оказывать на Россию и э, их попытки постоянно организовывать на российских границах горячие точки подобные украинские, развязывать конфликты военные с участием России. Значит, де факто это ну, война. So Rostislav says that yeah, it's basically other than formalized, it's not formalized, but everything the West does against Russia basically screams war. And uh, that's what uh, West wants to do with Russia. I see your comments, guys. Keep typing where you're watching from and what country, what time is there. Write your questions. As soon as I'm done uh, translating this interview for you with a former Ukrainian diplomat, Rostislav Ishenko, who served under one of Ukrainian presidents in the past in his career and now lives in Russia. And he's a politi uh, political analyst and a geopolitical analyst in the uh, he is graciously agreed to do this interview, so I hope you guys are learning something. It's a perspective from somebody who lived in Ukraine, now lives in Russia, so he has a point of reference of both countries, and who used to work for a Ukraine's president, one in the past. So uh, listen in, it's a very interesting interview. I enjoyed it, so I hope you guys are uh, enjoying it too. Yeah, Katie says USA, excellent. I am watching here, says from Spain, Ida, welcome. Excellent, we have Sweden. Everybody keep typing where you're watching from and keep your comments and questions. Back to the interview with a former Ukrainian diplomat about relations between Ukraine, United States, NATO, Poland, Germany, war in Ukraine, uh, listen in. Она требует затраты достаточно серьезных ресурсов. Это не мешает внутренней экономической, политической и финансовой стабильности в России и дальнейшему ее поступательному развитию. Да, это тормозит это развитие, но не мешает. Вот. И для того, чтобы люди не задавались вопросом, почему в Соединенных Штатах, где все было так хорошо, становится так плохо, а в России... He's basically saying that all of these sanctions, all these methods that are used against Russia to... Uh, in hopes by the West against Russia, in hopes to halt Russia's grow, growth. They're not halting Russia's growth, they only uh, slightly inconvenience Russia. And Russia keeps growing, Russia's economy keeps doing well. Um, and Rostislav said the only uh, damage it's causing basically is to those who try to inflict uh, damage on Russia. <laughs> And in order to distract uh, uh, the West uh, governments, in order to distract from their own people asking questions, why are we living so, uh, why our standard of living is so low and why are we living worse and, and worse every day? Uh, they need a scarecrow and scarecrow is Russia and Putin. So that's what they have. And that will be a good distraction for the people of these Western countries. From the bankruptcy? Group of democratic politicians, who represent the group of Clinton, Biden. And uh, the bankruptcy uh, of these uh, people who are not able to come up with any new, better ideas, and they're the group of Democrats, says uh, Rostislav Ishenko. And those are people who represent the group of Clintons, uh, Bidens, Значит, у которых нет позитивных предложений, позитивной повестки. And Obamas, those who have nothing positive, nothing uh, constructive to propose to American people. Для американской экономической политики. Значит, they don't have any economical, uh, constructive proposals, those people from Clinton, Obama and Biden group in Democrats. Um, in so basically, Rostislav says, as often it happens, the uh, absence of interior possibilities or interior inspiration uh, basically is being covered up by exterior means, by creating wars. 
with Russia. Ratislav, how long do you think this war will continue? And how do you think that Poland and Germany will decide to participate on the ground and to bring their forces to Brussels? I think on the next week there will be a convention of NATO, and they said that they will discuss a plan to bring вести большую войну а, какими-то другими методами, что это как-то, то есть какая-то коалиция или что-то за пределами НАТО они хотят, то есть у них там какая-то серьезная подготовка. I'm asking Rostislav because next week I believe in Brussels, uh, NATO, I, I think one of our generals uh, or maybe was uh, Mr. Miley, well, one of them said that they, I think they're going to get together with NATO allies and discuss uh, what are they going to do along the lines of creating some type of coalition outside of NATO. And of course, Biden going to Poland. So it's all very disturbing. Like, are they trying to get in to uh, the war with Russia uh, on the ground. I mean, I'm asking Rostislav. Как вы считаете, как долго эта война займет и какая роль Германии и Польши? And I'm asking him, what does he think how long this war will take, war in Ukraine, and what role does Poland and Germany play? Because you you guys know, right? If Poland is itching to go into Ukraine, that's a suicide mission. Unless um, it's some type of uh, within some type of a peace, uh, you know, peacekeepers framework uh, agreed with Russia. Russia told everybody, if you come in, you're a target, you are dead. I don't know. So I'm asking Rostislav in this question, uh, how long does he think that the war in Ukraine will go on? And what does Germany's and Poland's role in this? Uh, вот не последнее, э, не последнее э, значение, да, имеет э, решиться ли Польша. Ростислав, who is a former Ukrainian diplomat, is answering that yes, it's very important and uh, it's not to be disregarded uh, what Poland is going to do, what what type of decision in uh, this conflict and this war will Poland make. Вступить в открытую конфронтацию с Россией. У Польши есть и, и определенные эти, э, исторические проблемы, и проблемы ее актуальной политической концепции. He says Poland um, basically uh, is a very important player here, and Poland has a lot of sort of um, disputes or um, tensions with Russia, historic tensions, tensions on economic, political, uh, you know, arena. Uh, so, концепции безопасности, которые предполагают враждебные отношения к России. Значит, у Польши есть исторические претензии на часть украинских территорий. Poland um, would like to uh, possibly uh, take back or you know seize or have uh, have restored to itself a, a portion of western uh, territory of Ukraine. В частности, на территории Западной Украины, на территории Галиции. Uh, these territories called Galicia. И все эти претензии Польша и хотела бы, и, возможно, могла бы сейчас попытаться uh, реализовать. Uh, вот. And Poland would likely uh, would not want to miss this opportunity um, to hopefully return some of those territories back to uh, and restore it to Poland. But Poland is afraid of direct confrontation with Russia. But Poland is afraid because the United States made their position clear. Poland will fight Russia just as Poland, not as NATO country. NATO will not fight in this war with Russia. Значит, а поляки прекрасно понимают, что столкновение с Россией один на один рано или поздно приводит их к военно-политической катастрофе. 
поскольку Польша сейчас реформирует свою армию, пытается ее усилить примерно раз в год. And uh, Rostislav says, but Poland understands that one-on-one -on -one head collision with Russia will mean a destruction of Poland. So Poland is now trying to upgrade its army. It's trying to reform its army. Два. Но этот процесс достаточно длительный. И увеличение ее численное. И... And uh, Poland tries to double the size of its army, but it's going to take some time. Перевооружение армии. Оно... And they would have to re-equip their army, upgrade all the weaponry. Закончится не завтра и не послезавтра. And it will not end tomorrow or day after tomorrow. It will take some time to reorganize Polish army and to double its size and to upgrade its equipment and weaponry. Even if Poland upgrades its army, it still will not be a match for Russian army. It will be at a disadvantage. On all... Uh, On all the um, fronts, put it this way, on, in, in all the categories, the Polish army will not be a match for Russian army. Что касается остальных западноевропейских армий, то в свое время, опять-таки, эгоистичная политика Соединенных Штатов сыграла с возможностями НАТО злую шутку. Когда в середине 90-х годов решался вопрос, есть ли необходимость в существовании НАТО, And Rostislav says that, and if we talk about European armies, is that the um, United States uh, played an, a sort of like a wicked joke um, with an armies of NATO allies. And he's going to talk about the reform. In the 90s, apparently, United States proposed a NATO allies reform. Не стоит ли его заменить какой-то европейской структурой безопасности? В общем, общей европейской, которая охватывала бы всю Европу, включая Восточную, возможно, даже Россию. Вот тогда Соединенные Штаты, которые исходили из того, что таким образом, утратив свое военное влияние в Европе, они утратят и политическое влияние, они предложили реформу НАТО, которая теоретически экономила европейцам большое количество денег. He is basically saying that way back when in the 90s, Right. Uh, when some questions were raised, remember, I think even President Putin said at one point he was actually asking Clinton if Russia could join NATO. Remember that? And of course, he got snubbed. Putin uh, got snubbed by Clinton. So I don't think there was any response to that. But uh, Rostislav is basically explaining that in the 90s, when there was a need for the new European uh, security framework, remember when Soviet Union collapsed and G Germany re re reunified, then Rostislav says the um, uh, United States were afraid that maybe Europe will create something new, some type of a new framework for uh, security. So they proposed a reform of NATO. And what they did, says Rostislav, They basically uh, restricted European countries to what type of army or what type of specialized um, maybe brigades that uh, the European armies of different countries could have. And then America will provide the bulk services, the bulk uh, equipment, the ch supply chain and everything. So basically... That reform, while it was enticing for European countries and saved them a lot of money, basically uh, created European um, uh, armies, uh, national armies of the NATO countries, uh, they were shrinking and they became very narrow, specialized. And that's what Rostislav is hinting, uh, saying that the uh, United States proposed the reform of NATO in the 90s. Uh, which basically made European armies not as viable as before and more dependent on the United States. Они предложили реформу НАТО, в соответствии с которой Соединенные Штаты отвечали за всю командно-штабную и тыловую структуру за обеспечение. А европейские страны принимали концепцию узкой специализации и начинали выстраивать свои национальные армии по принципы экономии, то есть сокращали непрофильные э, подразделения, сокращали, значительно сокращали количество войск и техники, значительно сокращали 
средства, выделявшиеся на, на содержание национальных армий. Значит, и таким образом попадали в фактическую военную зависимость от Соединенных Штатов. So basically the European armies were shrinking their budgets, they were shrinking their armies, they were uh, basically becoming totally dependent on the United States. That was a NATO reform that Rostislav just referenced. Um, Carolyn says, yes, Clinton promoted the war with Russia while she was running for, for president. I am sure this war would have even come sooner had uh, she had her way. Yeah, I remember Clinton, um, Hillary Clinton at her debates with Donald Trump. Russia is evil, Putin is evil, all this other stuff. But then you guys remember uranium deal, right? Yeah, if you don't know uranium deal, Google up. When uh, Hillary Clinton, I think when she was uh, the Secretary of State, there was this uh, fancy uranium deal with Canada and then the United States, and uh, she got her approvals, and guess who was behind the deal? That was Russia. That was Russian banks. That was Putin. And there was something about Clinton's campaign manager was on the board of one of these companies who was seeking to buy this uranium or whatever. I don't know, guys. Google it up. I'd have to... Uh, it's like, it's really insane. So she's telling us that Russia is such a, is such a bad, horrible Russia. But behind the scenes, people, they're all playing ball. Understand that, right? They, they're playing ball. They're making money off of Russia. Even though Zelensky now is making money off of Russia. Because Ukraine is getting paid for transit fees of Russian gas through Ukrainian territory. Billions. While Zelensky tells Europeans to stop trading with Russia, to stop all relations with Russia, not buy Russian gas, not take Russians' bloody money, blood money. While Zelensky is taking Russia's blood money pretty well, he doesn't mind because Ukraine gets paid for the transit of Russian gas through Ukrainian's territory. Billions. And no, they did not refuse Russia's money. No, they didn't. Do your research, guys. Here we go, Medi says, nice. I am having some good comments. Hello from Slovenia, Lara Anna, wonderful. Everybody who's watching on YouTube or Facebook, right where you're watching from, I'm continuing the interview with um, a wonderful political analyst who now lives in Russia. Uh, we are speaking Russian in this interview and he is formerly Ukrainian diplomat, Rostislav Ishenko who worked for one of the presidents in Ukraine years ago and now contributes to Russia Today, a very famous news outlet. And um, everybody who's watching, uh, type from what country you're watching, what time is out there. If you're watching from United States, what state you're watching. I see Maine. I saw New Zealand here, uh, Christine and Z. And I see Norway. Uh, we have watching from Thailand. Great job, Miss Elena. Thank you very much. Ida says, great job. Okay, guys, I love your compliments. Slovenia, uh, somebody's watching on Facebook. Katie's watching on the Facebook. We have Tommy saying, good job. Everything you said is true. I believe I see it in my country. They blame Putin for everything. Wow, I know it's not true. It's all the US and Europe, and we're paying for the consequences, says Tommy. Yep, I agree. Tommy, type what country you're watching from. We have Derek also saying, I'm watching you from Ghana. Good job. Welcome, Derek. Welcome, Ghana. We have, this was the interview I was hoping would be translated. Thanks, Elena, says Mary. Yes, that's what we're going through. Uh, we're going word by word translation and I, so I could comment because you guys don't always know all the Ukrainian names and every Ukrainian president that's been mentioned. So I have an opportunity to translate and comment as we go. So we'll keep doing that. And Tommy says he's from Italy, watching from Italy. Excellent. We have Mohammed walking, watching from Chicago. Hello, Mohammed. I'm just across the lake from you. Just uh, 90 miles, I believe. Excellent. We have Australia. Christine Margaret Holland says, uh, so right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, Iliana Dashkova says, New Zealand. Wonderful. We have Katie. It's all about one world order. 
Yep, guys, back to the interview. Everybody who is watching on Facebook, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Elena USA Live. Everybody who is watching on YouTube and Facebook, uh, type your comments and what country you're watching, what time is down there. We'll uh, do another quick break and get to your comments as we're watching an interview with Rostislav Ishinko, former Ukrainian diplomat who worked for one of the presidents of Ukraine. He currently lives in Russia and works for uh, Russia Today. He is a guest on a lot of Russian top billing shows on TV and Russian uh, geopolitical shows. And he's very famous, so uh, you guys have a treat and this very exclusive interview. I'm glad that I was able to get Rostislav for you. After the NATO reform, after the United States completed the NATO reform, the reform not particularly worked as well and it wasn't completed as it was intended. But because of that NATO reform in the 90s that United States have proposed and was undertaken, now European armies by themselves without United States Army are basically a good for nothing, says Rostislav Ishenko. That's why it's very difficult for United States now to force Europeans to fight without United States support. Because um, the NATO allies now in European armies understand that they don't have enough weapons. They are not really fight ready, battle ready. You would have to deal with them for two or three years to revamp them a little bit, the European armies. У них нет достаточного количества расходных материалов, то есть буквально нет на складах ракет, снарядов и так далее для ведения длительной войны. По оценке американцев... They are um, basically running out of rockets and they are running uh, uh, from uh, particular munitions. Let me see. Maybe says smash the like button. Everybody smash the like button on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, Daniel says you're not seeing all your comments. You missed a lot of them. No, I didn't miss them, Daniel. I'm going to get back to them once I'm done translating the interview. I'll go through all the comments again. And I've been playing quite a few. So um, just so you know, we are not missing any comments here. If I didn't play some of them, I will get back to them once I'm done with the interview. We have here thanking you for reporting in English from Philippines. Speak the truth so we would know and decide accordingly. We see through Western lies amplified by corrupt Western media and are looking for alternative truth tellers. Thank you very much, Arden. That's what we're doing here. We're trying to speak the truth and we're trying to get it from the people who actually lived in Ukraine, people who know something about Ukraine, not from CNN reporters who will just tell us what Biden wants us to hear. So, wonderful. Thank you, Elena from the United States, says Ricky. Um, Ricky, uh, always um, uh, keep uh, typing from, from your countries uh, you're watching. Yes, I agree. Can't we just all get along, says Alan? Yeah, apparently we can't. Biden doesn't want us to. You know, like uh, ancient Roman divide and conquer. Yeah, they keep dividing us. I mean, everybody was divided on whether they like, you know, sushi or they like pizza. Then whether they like this brand of car or that brand of car. Now we're divided on all the social issues. People at the family dinners cannot even talk to each other because they're afraid to say something their own family members may disapprove and stop talking them over. And it's unbelievable. So back to the interview, Rostislav is saying that European armies are basically right now without American army are not really viable. 
and it would take two or three years for them to possibly even become viable. We're talking about Poland and Germany. Well, these two countries, what is their role? Would they get involved in the war in Ukraine? Here's what Rostislav has to say. So he's basically saying if Poland gets involved, United States was clear with Poland. Poland, if you go in, you're not going in as a NATO country, you're just going in as Poland. And Poland, says Rostislav, is afraid to go in as not a NATO country, just as Poland. Because obviously, without baking of United States and NATOs coming with Poland into Ukraine war, Poland will be destroyed, says Rostislav. So that's a concern, but he is also concerned that Poland may have too much temptation not to go in and get involved in Ukraine's war. Еще до начала России СВО. Единственная европейская армия, которая может или могла на тот момент серьезно противостоять России, это была французская армия, как считали. Ростислав says the only mine, uh, army in, you, in, you, in Europe that could actually um, show some resistance to, to Russian army at the time. Американские военные. Ну, причем... Они не сходили из того, что в, в, в интенсивном военном конфликте французская армия сможет продержаться It was a French army. около полутора месяца. But even American analysts, the military analysts, says Rostislav, was saying that uh, French uh, army can only last for about a month or month and a half in the direct conflict. После чего у нее закончатся расходные after which it will run out of resources and weapons. It will not be able to fight anymore. There will not be anything to fight with, talking about French army. Rostislav says, however, the war in Ukraine actually showed to NATO and to all the armies in the world that modern warfare is even more labor intensive and more weaponry intensive as was even um, considered. In other words, modern warfare, if um, in the 90s they made the prediction that French army being the strongest of the allies could last for a month and a half, otherwise it will run out of weaponry, uh, and resources and supplies. Now, Rostislav says, the military analysts see that it's even faster that the armies go through weapons in the modern warfare than expected. Of course, we didn't have a war in Europe since World War II, right? Uh, nothing like this ever happens in the last, uh, uh, since um, 1945, a victory over Hitler way back when. So the military analysts only had projections, but now they actually see the war in real time, and now they see that their projections actually are way too generous. And the armies will not last in a modern warfare, let's say against Russia, they will run out of weapons sooner than they actually think. And uh, Rostislav says, in their prediction that maybe the strongest army of Europe could last for one and a half months, but it appears it can it'd be lucky if it if can uh, hold up for three weeks or a few weeks. And and he says, and everybody is concerned in Europe, and even Europeans are concerned because they they are saying now, Europeans, we didn't have enough weapons to begin with, and now we're giving all of our weapons, the little that we had, to Ukraine. So we don't have anything to fight with. So Rostislav says, so when the Europeans are being asked and uh, possibly pushed by United States to get involved and in some way, shape or form, uh, or if Poland or Germany will get pushed uh, to uh, actually fight Russia on the ground, 
uh, or, or even get confrontation, direct confrontation with Russia, they're saying uh, and they're asking the United States, what are we going to fight Russia with? We don't have anything to fight Russia with. And of course, they're concerned of trying uh, to get involved. And then Europeans say, okay, United States, we, we agree, we can get involved, we can get on the ground, but only with you. We don't want to be by ourselves going confronting Russia. And United States do not want to fight with, with Russia in, in direct conflict, directly confronting Russia on the ground. Because it's a war between two nuclear countries. And for United States to have a full-scale on-the-ground war with Russia across the globe where there's difficult logistics, with an army that's another nuclear nation, with an army that's pretty much uh, a very strong and equipped army as Russian army, it's not really a, um, a proposition that the United States would consider attractive. It's American. С союзниками, которые серьезно не могут поддержать Соединенные Штаты, и которые далеко не все и не всегда надежны. С необходимостью... And on top of it, United States cannot really account on its allies to support United States going into this war. And they're not all that reliable, these allies. Remember, guys, just recently they had this Rammstein meeting and everybody was screaming, oh, yes, we will give thanks to Ukraine. We'll do this for Ukraine. We'll do that. And then I think, what is it? Sweden and um, um, who else? It, uh, a couple of, no, Sweden and Finland didn't get into NATO, but there were two countries, gosh, I forget. I think, um, don't quote me, Google it. A couple of countries at the Rammstein who were originally going to give Ukraine some more weapons, all of a sudden said, no, we're not going to give anything. I was like, what? So you see what Rostislav is saying that America cannot even count on its own allies because they really are not reliable. One day they say we'll do something, and they say, oh, no, no, you go deal with Russia yourself, United States. So, uh, uh, обеспечивать протяженные логистические цепочки, как для доставки вооружений и поиски техники, так и для обслуживания всего этого. Значит, такая война для Соединенных крайне затратна и не может быть выиграна. Поэтому американцы не хотят вести Rostislav said such a war where United States would be directly fighting Russia on the other side of the world, another nuclear uh, power with a very capable equipped army and the uh, allies of United States who are not reliable. Rostislav said to United States, that's not attractive, not attractive proposition. Medi says he is 100% correct. Russian operational planning is so much more calculated than how the West approaches war. A far greater understanding of the warfare of today's battlefield. Excellent, thank you, great comment. Mohammed says the old world war mongering politicians are corrupting the new generations by feeding them lies. Exactly true. Well, we all can use bows and arrows, says Richard Hecky. <laughs> so you want to go fight Russia with bows and arrows? <laughs> all right. Ida says the Netherlands is one of those countries. I think the other one is Poland. You're right, Ida. There's those two countries, very true, Netherlands, and I almost think you may be right, Poland, who showed up in, um, at the table basically um, decided not to send whatever they were asked, even though promising to last minute to Ukraine. So no agreement between NATO quote unquote allies uh, that America could count of. Rostislav, Rostislav is correct in his analysis. Let's keep listening in. United States, he says, do not want to get involved in direct Conventional warfare or nuclear warfare with Russia? Well, 
United States just want that somebody else would fight Russia and United States would just benefit from somebody else fighting Russia and, and collect dividends from that. И, в принципе, они бы убедили бы европейцев повоевать вместо них. У них это неоднократно получалось. Но, повторяю, в результате инициированных американцами же реформ в военной сфере, в том числе в НАТО в 90-е годы, европейцы теперь спрашивают, а чем мы будем воевать? Ну, вот... And uh, Rostislav says, and, and uh, those European allies, they wouldn't mind to go fight, but they're asking, what are we going to fight Russia with? Yeah. Have some good comments. If you guys see all these different uh, comments, you can also type yours and questions. We'll get back to them uh, later on. Сейчас, допустим, эти британские военные продолжают ставные, говорят, да, в начале 90-х годов на Рейне стояла 80-тысячная британская рейнская армия. А сейчас вот и Британии нет такого количества военных. Rostislav says, if you ask British military guys, they will tell you uh, in the 90s or so while back when, they had about 80,000 troops standing um, on the Rhine, what is it, Rhine brigades. And now they can't even uh, gather that many. In other words, the, the size of British army is diminished. Also, they don't have enough weapons and equipment. Которая могла в любой момент выставить несколько корпусов, 400 тысяч штыков для поддержки более чем тысячи танков. Now, Rostislav says German army could produce 400,000 troops with support of about a thousand tanks. Bundeswehr, 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 right? The German army that he's talking about. Сейчас, в лучшем случае, Bundeswehr сможет выставить 200 боеготовых. But right now, Bundeswehr, at, at the best, its best capacity can maybe produce 200 tanks or maybe 250. 50. А уж по... Том, сможет ли он собрать хотя бы 150 тысяч солдат, это огромная тайна, этого никто не знает. And uh, if Bundes Bundeswehr, meaning German army, can produce 150,000, even that many, it's even a big secret. Nobody knows if they can. Way back when they were able to produce 400,000. Now Rostislav says, we're not sure if they can produce 150,000. That's a mystery if they can. Знает, может быть, сможет, а может быть и нет. То есть банально Европе нечем бывать ни людей, ни техники, ни расходных материалов. И э, когда Соединенные Штаты сейчас пытаются этот вопрос решить и пытаются перезапустить работу военно-промышленного комплекса и у себя, и в Европе, то речь идет о том, что э, Америка, Соединенные Штаты смогут производить в месяц столько снарядов, сколько сейчас Россия расходует на э, линии фронта в день, вот в месяц они производить такое количество снарядов смогут только в лучшем случае к 25-26 году. Это в лучшем случае. А это... Ростислав says that um, America now is trying to produce more weapons, but all the weapons that I needed in the, in the quantities that they needed America will possibly be able to produce them by the year 25-26 only. In other words, it's not instant. То она должна обеспечивать ведение этой войны с колес. То есть в день должно производиться столько же снарядов, сколько расходуется, желательно еще и больше. He says if the country really is going to sustain the war, they're supposed to produce as many munitions and weapons as are basically expelled a day to create the surplus. But it doesn't seem like uh, anybody is capable, especially the United States at this point, to produce more than it's been used in such quantities than uh, even uh, NATO, what is it, uh, Jens Stoltenberg came out and said that they essentially are out of weapons to send to Ukraine. Remember the couple of days ago? 
пока что таких возможностей военных нет ни у Соединенных Штатов, ни у Европы. Но повторяю, поскольку Соединенным Штатам Соединенные Штаты сами воевать не собираются, а сколько европейских стран при этом будет там, уничтожено, покалечено, сколько европейских стран э, разорятся экономически в подобного рода конфликтах, им по большому счету все равно. He says, United States are not going to go and fight themselves, but they really do not care how many countries they will throw into this uh, fiery furnace of war with Russia and how many countries will destroy themselves over Russia. He says, United States do not care. Um, so everybody who is watching, type what country you're watching, type the comments we're talking and uh, uh, I am translating you the interview of former Ukrainian diplomat who now lives in Russia and his opinion about uh, the war in Ukraine and what's going to happen next. Um, my question to him was, will Germany and Poland get involved? And he's answering that right now, talking about United States wanting to push some European countries into war, but not as NATO countries. And that there isn't really enough uh, weaponry to spare to sustain modern warfare with Russia. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. I see Australia. Everybody type in uh, where you're watching from, what time is over there, and type your comments. I will get back to them as soon as we're done. Поэтому они пытаются сейчас организовать большую европейскую войну по принципу, ну, года два, там, два с половиной Европа посопротивляется России, а за это время Россия понесет экономические издержки, Россия понесет какие-то потери в людях серьезные, значит, Россия понесет финансовые потери какие-то, и, соответственно, у Соединенных Штатов появится лучшая переговорная позиция для того, чтобы отстаивать свои интересы в рамках заключения какого-то нового новой глобальной сделки. So Rostislav is saying, uh, remember I, I asked him how many years he thinks this war is going to take. He says that uh, United States would like to have this war linger and the Russia weakened over time. And in the meantime, while Russia is being weakened and this war lingers, exhausting Russia, exhausting Russia's resources, then United States can come up with some type of a framework that suits United States to basically force Russia into. And it could go for a couple of years uh, until they feel that Russia is weakened enough to where it will accept whatever is thrown in, in her way. Thank you. Welcome, New Zealand. Well, welcome, Australia. Welcome, Netherlands. Everybody right from where you're watching from. Do we have anybody? USA, USA. Everybody. Let me see. Alan says, how come no one is trying to broker a peace deal? I think Russia helping Joe Biden by everyone focused on the war, not him. Uh, well, Alan, I think Rostislav here is explaining. He says they don't want the peace deal with Russia. They want to exhaust Russia. They want to linger this war, to extend this war, what he is saying, in order for Russia to be weakened. Uh, and for Russian resources to be weakened, for Russia's abilities and capacities to be weakened, and then they could uh, pretty much dictate whatever the conditions that they want to Russia. USA, wonderful, Katie. Everybody who is watching right from what country? We have Canada also. Excellent. Keep typing, guys, from uh, what countries you're watching, what time is over there, and your thoughts as we're watching the interview with Rostislav Ishenko. Американцы сейчас говорят, мы согласны, мы готовы к переговорам, да? но только их позиции исключают компромисс. Соединенных... Ростислав says, Americans are now are saying, oh, we are open to peace talk, only their position is excluding any kind of compromise. Remember Victoria Newland recently said, oh, we, we would talk to Russia, but Russia has to do this, this and that and, and give back all the territories, and it's like, Russia said it's not going to do it. So this is not really an invitation to the peace talk. That's what my reaction will be. I said it sounds like an ultimatum. It's an ultimatum. Штаты приходят и говорят, вот это вот наша позиция, да, если хотите, мы можем на основе этой позиции договориться. Но эта позиция означает просто давайте вы нам сдадитесь. Да? Ультиматум, ультиматум просто. Hear me, I said ultimatum, that's ultimatum. 
So Rostislav, former Ukrainian diplomat who now lives in Russia and contributes to Russia Today RT, he's saying that the way United States offer peace, so to speak, or peace talks is you're going to fulfill our conditions or else. And Rostislav says this is basically a surrender. The United States do not want to negotiate peace. United States wants to negotiate Russia's surrender, basically unconditional surrender by offering Russia terms it cannot accept. So, so no. так, давайте вы нам сдадите буквально. Значит, этого никто не собирается делать, потому что давным-давно уже Россия и Китай чувствуют себя достаточно сильными, чтобы противостоять Америке как на поле боя, так и в финансово-экономической сфере. Если в Соединенных Штатах это не понимают, это проблема Соединенных Штатов, но это не проблема Кремля, это не проблема Пекина. Вот. Поэтому у нас пока что возможность договориться отсутствует, так как официальная... So Rostislav says America has a lot of problems, and these are internal economical problems of Ukraine of, of United States. But these are internal problems of United States are not problems of Russia or China or Beijing. So he says that now we don't have any opportunity, we meaning he is in Russia. Russia does not have any opportunity to negotiate with the United States. Которые Соединенные Штаты принудили Европу, это э, э, Запад должен одержать победу над Россией на поле боя. На поле боя. He says basically United States and the Western countries declared that the West wants to declare victory over Russia just on the battlefield. That's it. In other words, no peace talks, just ultimatums. Then basically, Russia, if you want to talk peace, here's your surrender conditions. Oh. You don't want that? Well, then we'll keep fighting you on the battlefield until you lose. So that's pretty much it. Welcome, Ricky. Ricky says, old man Biden create wars and young people die. United States, 12.57 p.m. Thanks, Ricky. Welcome, United States. Marian says, Biden is out of space. He's losing it. He's mentally and physically not capable to make any decisions. He forgets even that he is U.S. president. Just remember what happened in Kabul, Afghanistan in the summer of 2021. Embarrassment and total disgrace to America and left $85 billion worth of military weapons to the Taliban. Also 12 Marines were left to die in Afghanistan. He's total disgrace. He should be impeached ASAP. Thanks, Marion. Yeah, Afghanistan was a total disaster. He basically armed the Taliban, and he is our president. This is insane. Everybody, um, we're watching an interview with Rostislav Ishenko, former Ukrainian diplomat who now lives in Russia. And uh, he used to work for one of the Ukrainian presidents in the past. Um, obviously, he does not agree with uh, what the direction Ukraine has taken. Therefore, he moved to Russia. And he's contributed to Russia Today, uh, you know, that famous news outlet. And he's a very frequent guest on a lot of top Russian shows where they discuss geopolitics, current war events, and uh, uh, Ukraine. So listening in. Type in what countries you're watching from. And uh, welcome, Max. Excellent. Пусть попробуют, конечно, но, в общем-то, пока что получается у них очень плохо одерживать победу над Россией на поле боя. И думаю, что дальше будет получаться еще хуже. Ростислав, сколько лет? Ростислав says, if the West declared that they want um, for Russia uh, to be defeated on the battlefield, he says, let's see them try. For right now, it doesn't look they are, that they're succeeding, says uh, um, Rostislav. Daniel, welcome, USA. Daniel Hayes, welcome. Alan says we need to bring back former President Trump to run Canada in the USA. We have Michael. Isn't it true that Ukraine provoked the succession of Eastern Ukrainian provinces by denying them their linguistic rights? Absolutely true, Michael. Uh, that was one of the many grievances that Eastern provinces had. Uh, one of the grievances was that the Western-backed coup by Obama, Biden, Pelosi, 
Newland, uh, McCain, Kerry, and all those people sponsored coup in Ukraine in 2014 removed the legally and democratically elected president of Ukraine. So Eastern provinces said, wait a minute, you removed the president we voted for. This is our elected president. Where did he go? What did you do to the guy? But the coup government who removed him, backed by United States and EU, Victoria Newland handpicked the coup government, started to quickly bomb the eastern provinces of Ukraine and remove their rights, linguistic rights and other rights. Now Zelensky turned completely into dictator. But don't get me started, guys. Let's keep watching the interview so we can get through that and then we'll answer questions. Latina says, I'm watching from France, my friend Elena Oki. Beautiful Latina, welcome. Always like when you join our lives. Everybody type from what countries you're working, watching. Um, yeah, working. If you're working and watching, type that too. Uh, Daniel says, Russian military ships have surrounded the USA over the Nord Stream pipeline. I don't know about that one. I know Putin now, a Russian president, I believe, is demanding UN investigation uh, So about the Nord Stream pipeline. Max says, thank you for update from Vancouver, Canada, 11 a.m. Perfect. Welcome. So let's keep listening to Rostislav. Как вы думаете, это все займет, если НАТО попытается каким-то образом еще ввести туда Германию и Польшу на территорию Украины? И закончит ли Россия тогда, как Вторая мировая война в Берлине? И, и... I'm asking Rostislav if he thinks that if uh, Poland and Germany or any other NATO allies, even not as NATO, will join the war against Russia, is it going to end up on the borders of uh, uh, Germany and Poland in, in, in Berlin then, just like World War II? I mean, where this can go if Germany and Poland might get involved somehow on the ground? Польша. Это такое впечатление, что все идет к тому, что история повторяется. Как вы думаете, сколько лет это может занять? Потому что вы правы. А, никакой договорной способности ни у одной из сторон нет, потому что никто э, не готов ни на какие компромиссы. I'm basically asking him, and I'm saying that it looks like neither side has any compromises that they're ready for. Uh, Poland and Germany may, may get involved. Are we going to repeat history here? World War II, Russia at the border of Germany, uh, uh, in, uh, finishing the war in Germany and Poland. Россия, естественно, не устраивает а, то, что происходит на Украине, и она не хочет, чтобы Украина превратилась в страну НАТО. А нас в Америке бы это не устроило, если бы Россия при, э, решила поставить свои ракеты в Мексику. Помните кубинский кризис 1964 -го года? А, и вдруг Россия должна согласиться с Украиной в НАТО? And I am saying as part of my question is that we... Obviously, this uh, no parties want to negotiate. Russia has its own concerns, security concerns. We, America, would not have liked if Russia placed its rockets in Mexico, right? Because remember the Cuban crisis, 1964. And then, but Russia somehow has to be happy and let Ukraine join NATO and place rockets right up to Russia's border, I am saying. Of course, Russia is not going to agree to that. Those terms are not acceptable to Russia. So I'm asking Rostislav, how does he see, you know, where this all is going to go? И ракеты НАТО прямо к российской границе. Россия это естественно не подходит ни под какими, ни в каком виде. Но если НАТО и наш Байден собирается воевать с Россией. Uh, и еще втянуть Германию и Польшу и наращивать способ... возможности НАТО. Как вы думаете, сколько лет это все займет и что станет с Германией и Польшей, если они войдут туда? Закончит ли Россия на границах этих стран? Если, если войдут, это просто ключевой вопрос. Потому что если поляки э, войдут на Украину, бескомпромиссно собираясь воевать с Россией, значит, 
то э, ситуация станет очень близка к общеевропейской войне, причем она выйдет из-под контроля просто. Дальше политики уже будут заложниками самой ситуации. Я повторяю, Соединенные Штаты и НАТО не могут допустить поражения страны НАТО от прямой конфронтации с Россией. Here is the key part, guys. Listen to this, what Rostislav says. He says that those countries don't want, uh, the, country, the countries could get in, but the United States doesn't really want to see any of the NATO countries defeated by Russia. Even if they come in and participate in war in Ukraine, not as a NATO country, they are members of NATO, right? Imagine the embarrassment if Poland or Germany or both would get involved, fight against Russia or anybody, I don't know, French or, or Brits decide to go and challenge Russia on the battlefield. And then if they get defeated, that would be embarrassing. At this point, we're talking about Poland in Germany. Poland is the likeliest candidate of possibly trying to get dragged into it. Um, I'm wondering why is Biden going to Poland next week, I believe. Um, I'm wondering if why. Maybe, maybe. But um, we know Polish soldiers already are dying in Ukraine. Several months ago, there was an article that they had 1,200 soldiers uh, of Polish guys died in Ukrainian war. I don't know if they're mercenaries or they're just out of uniform to, pretending to be Ukrainians because it's not real that easy to tell Polak and Ukrainian apart. I mean, I mean, they, they look alike. Yeah, I've been there. I lived there. I know what I'm talking about. And the languages are not all that different. So you can understand each other if you're Polish or Ukrainian. So the poor guys, the Polish guys that have been dragged into Ukraine war are coming back dead. And, and if they dragged even into, uh, into this as their official army and troops in big numbers, it's going to be devastating. And of course, Poland will become a target. So let's listen in Rostislav. Even if Poland would fight Russia as Poland, not as NATO country, and be defeated by Russia, that would be devastating and embarrassing for NATO to have a NATO country defeated by Russia in Europe. Ну и Россия не собирается в одной войну проигрывать. Следовательно, мы имеем такую двухступенчатую модель, которая на первом этапе приводит очень быстро к опасности общей европейской войны, а на втором этапе приводит к опасности ядерного столкновения. Потому что He says, if any of these countries joins the war in Ukraine, we have a two-step, two-fold problem that is going to be un unveiled basically here. He says, first, uh, we're going to have a European, inter-European conflict that's going to develop if either Poland or Germany gets involved on the ground. And then it's going to be a nuclear confrontation, the step two. And he says, this situation can get out of control if either Poland or Germany or both will get involved or any countries of NATO, even if they don't come as NATO country. If they come in, and then situation gets out of control. The step one, out of control between European countries. It's inter-European conflict now. And step two, the escalation, it's a nuclear conflict, says Rostislav Ishenko. В рамках общей европейской войны очень великое искушение значит, проигрывающей стороны или стороны, которая чувствует себя недостаточно уверенно, применить вначале тактическое ядерное оружие, а дальше уже очень недалеко и до обмена стратегическими ударами. Because Rostislav says, if you have this type of conflict in Europe and both countries feel that they're at the stalemate or one country is actually losing, there is a big temptation to first try a tactical nuclear weapons and then possibly use strategic nuclear weapons as the next step. So this is a very dangerous scenario should this ever happen, meaning Poland getting involved or getting in or Germany or any country that is a NATO country get involved even in non-NATO type capacity 
against Russia in the war in Ukraine. Потому что эта война может продлиться долго, хотя она может продлиться долго. Because this war uh, can last long, it could last long. Даже если она будет без применения ядерного оружия, а именно. Even if it is without using nuclear weapons. Потому что это последний шаг в рамках регулируемого кризиса. Кризис уже сейчас не очень регулируемый. То есть уже сейчас многие политики просто не могут сделать шаг назад и вынуждены играть в повышение ставок, в том числе в первую очередь относится к западным политикам, которые не могут выйти. Very shaky, and it's hardly regulatable. In other words, it's unpredictable, and it can get out of control very fast. Should either Germany or Poland, uh, or any other country, get involved in this, or number of countries on behalf of Ukraine, uh, which would be NATO-type countries. Uh, so Rostislav says that this could be. This is already unpredictable on the shaky ground, murky waters here. Because politicians don't have reverse gear, they don't want to negotiate, and they keep escalating. He says it's already dangerous, but it could get even more irreversibly dangerous should any of the countries get their troops on the ground into Ukraine. Идти на тот компромисс, который бы был бы для них приемлем еще, скажем, там год полтора назад теоретически, потому что они слишком далеко зашли в конфронтации. And he says the further this war goes, the more it escalates. The further this um, United States and the Western allies are taking this conflict with Russia, the harder for them to uh, decompress this counter conflict. The harder for them to find an off ramp because they're escalated and then they have escalated the, the, the fight with Russia. The conflict is basically as a self-propelled propelled mechanism keeps moving forward. Uh, and it will get out, or it's already out of their control in some ways, but it will get even more if they keep going and escalating it. And they have promised too many times to defeat Russia. So it's very hard for them now to de-escalate and uh, basically uh, deflate their own egos. Um, after they just kept building them up, that they're going to beat Russia. We're going to win. We're going to beat Russia on the battlefield. Yay, let's go. И они слишком далеко зашли в жертвах, которые уже принесены западными обществами для того, чтобы победить Россию. And Rostislav says also, the Western politicians already are too far. They're knee deep and too far in depth with the amount of sacrifice that the Western societies and had to sacrifice. To, to sustain this war and the amount of victims and the amount of sacrifice that it's already in into the coffers of this war is the mounting up. Теперь надо объяснять, зачем была разрушена экономика Германии, зачем разрушается сейчас экономика Европы, если можно было совершенно спокойно договориться. Now they would have to explain to their respective uh, uh, basically, people of their country saying, uh, so why did you destroy Germans' economy? Why did you destroy our country's economy if you could just sit down and talk and negotiate with Russia? And as well, these politicians, they don't have an off-ramp because they're too far. They're too far on, on their gig, on their scam, trying to get Russia into the war, then getting war uh, with Russia started and then destroying Ukraine, destroying the economies of Germany, destroying the economy of the United States, our inflation is through the roof, our economy is in crisis as well. We're in recession. And then what? And these politicians can just say, oh yeah, forget about Ukraine, we're good now, let's sit down and talk to Russia. Then the people of all the countries in the world are going to say, wait a minute, you couldn't talk to Russia before you blew up Nord Stream pipeline? And, and made us destitute here in Germany. You couldn't talk to Russia before. Hundreds of thousands of people cannot afford the basic groceries and not even mention hundreds of thousands. Ukrainians are laying dead in graves and Russians and civilians are misplaced and refugees are all over Europe. Millions of people are displaced. So you couldn't talk to Russia before all of that? that you instigated all of this stuff. So Rostislav is saying they're too far uh, 
in on their um, on their con to just uh, put on the brake and 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 stop abruptly. So they'll keep playing this uh, alone for a while. Поэтому уже, уже сейчас ставки слишком высоки для того, чтобы легко достигнуть соглашения, и кризис переходит в неуправляемую стадию. Если э, на Украине непосредственно столкнется Россия хотя бы с одним государством НАТО, то почти неизбежно. Говорю почти, потому что всегда есть допуск на маленькую вероятность, на чудо. Да? Но почти неизбежно вступление в этот конфликт и других государств НАТО. Может быть не всех, но и в значительной части. Rostislav says the danger here is even if one country of NATO will join this war, uh, he says there is always a miracle. I don't say it's inevitable, but it's almost inevitable if one country joins this war in Ukraine, a NATO country, then it's likely then some other countries will have to join as well. And that's where the danger is, Rostislav says. Guys, everybody who is watching, type in some comments. Where are you watching from? And uh, type in some of your questions. We'll address them as we go along here with interview I have with a former Ukrainian diplomat, Rostislav Ishingo, who now lives in Russia. We're talking about war in Ukraine and Zelensky and everybody else. So keep watching and type your comments and where you're watching from. YouTube, Facebook, subscribe, like, comment. Вот. А таким образом кризис сразу перерастает в общую европейскую войну. Если Соединенным Штатам сейчас трудно, морально-политически трудно проиграть войну на Украине, в которой они де-факто участвуют, но до юра не... еще, еще труднее будет проиграть общую европейскую войну. Проигрыш американцами общей европейской войны означает вытеснение Соединенных Штатов из Европы. He is saying that if United States right now is de facto at war with Russia um, because they're supplying weapons and they're feeding this conflict, but it's difficult if it would be if Russia and Ukraine, uh, the war would end um, unfavorably to Ukraine, that would be one thing. But if one of the NATO countries would join the war in Ukraine and that country would have gotten defeated in the future, or the number of NATO countries would lose against Russia, that would be devastating, Rostislav says, for United States and their hegemony in Europe. And that would actually force United States out of Europe as the viable player. Не потому что их оттуда там Россия даже будет прогонять, а просто потому что европейцам не будет нужен союзник, который втравил их войну, he says, and it's not that United States will be uh, thrown out of Europe or forced out of Europe by, by anything that Russia would do. The Europeans themselves will force United States out of their affairs if any NATO countries join the war in Ukraine and they lose against Russia. They will then look around and say, why do we need an ally, meaning United States, who doesn't help us to win uh, in this war? Why do we need it to have a, any kind of union with the United States in the form of security framework? So he's basically saying that this will be quite devastating uh, for uh, United States uh, if any of the NATO countries would get involved and uh, they would be... Uh, then uh, losing to Russia, then Europeans would look around and say, why do we need to be dependent on the United States if they didn't help us to protect us then from Russia and Russia won. So watching from, let me see, I, I can't tell, Bushurst, uh, praying for peace, excellent. Guys, you put me all the, your different abbreviations. When you type, make sure I can read it. Uh, type in the caps too, right? So I don't have to wear my glasses. Uh, we have Alex San Antonio, Texas here. Thank you for your information. Thank you, Alex. Let's keep watching. Rotislav Ishenko. Guys, type from uh, type uh, comments where you're watching from. What time is there? What country you're in? What town you're in? Значит, 
более стесненных условиях. То есть победа любой ценой будет еще важнее, чем она сейчас, еще нужнее, чем сейчас нужна. Rostislav makes a good point. He says if any of these countries like Poland or Germany will join the war against Russia, war in Ukraine, then the victory that United States wants on the battlefield would be even more important. Because of course, then it will be like reputation. Oh, it's like, oh la la, the NATO country cannot lose to Russia. That would be embarrassment that would... Uh, forced United States being looked at as a non-viable partner for the security framework. That's what Rostislav says. Excellent analysis. Do you guys, are you guys enjoying this? Type some comments. Let me know if you even like it, um, that uh, I am spending all this time translating this uh, interview to you because I am enjoying it. I think it's an amazing insight. It's a great perspective. He's a great analyst. Uh, type in some comments if you like this and uh, if you are learning something. I am certainly learning and I certainly enjoy this, uh, but I am doing it for you. So type uh, some comments for me and let me know that uh, you like this interview. If you're learning something on what are your thoughts on what Rostislav is saying? А любая цена предполагает в том числе и ядерный шантаж. От ядерного шантажа не так далеко до, собственно, ядерного удара. А ядерный удар всегда предполагает he says, and this can escalate if any of the NATO countries would join the war in Ukraine, then they would basically uh, escalate to nuclear conflict because if you do the tactic nukes, then uh, you could do nuke strikes, uh, nuclear strikes. It's just, uh, it's just, you never know, it escalates fast. А дальше, потом, по нарастающей, можно очень быстро, можно в течение суток, можно в течение недели, а можно в течение месяца перейти от обмена небольшими тактическими до обмена стратегическими. Yeah. And uh, Rostislav says, if this escalates, it could take days or weeks, or it could take a month, but you could start from little tactical nukes, and then it could become strategical. You just never know how fast this can escalate into nuclear disaster and the new full-fledged nuclear conflict. Поэтому все это очень опасно, что опасно не потому, что война может продлиться долгие годы, она может продлиться долгие годы, значит, а именно потому, что она может быть очень короткой, но очень разрушительной, после которой человечество еще неизвестно соберут ли, значит, и будет на земле цивилизация. Вот. Если and Rostislav says that if this happens, if we get into nuclear confrontation, then we don't even know if there will be any civilizations left uh, after this. And uh, if in the entire civilization will be destroyed. So this is very dangerous conflict that, that could uh, mushroom into nuclear exchange that will destroy civilization as we know it, says Rostislav. Quick question, Michael says, do you know what Russia's policies are towards their own indigenous linguistic rights? Well, Russia's policy, my understanding, when Russia was a part of Soviet Union, the main language of the Soviet Union was Russian. However, each republic had the second language was the language of whatever they felt the most people would be able to learn at school and also talk as a second language. You were given an opportunity to study a second language and uh, other languages of all the people that were ethnic groups of Russia are allowed, but official language was Russia, Russian. So right now Russia also has, I believe, maybe hundreds of ethnic groups that live on Russia's territory and their main language is Russian, but Russia does not disallow ethnic groups and ethnic people not use their own language, uh, unlike Ukraine, who now disallows native Russian speakers to speak in Russian while they're living in Ukraine. That's insanity. So quick question, back to the interview. Type people, where are you watching from and if it's interesting? Okay, I hope I will get through this interview with you and answering questions and I will do that later on. Um, around 200 groups. Yes, Eugene, around 200 different ethnic uh, nationalities groups, people uh, of Russia. It's a multicultural, multinational, uh, multi-ethnic country, Russia. And so is Ukraine. 
if you think Ukraine uh, has only one group of people living there or two Ukrainians and Russians, no. Google it up. They have also over 100 different ethnic uh, uh, Romani people, Jewish people, Azerbaijanians, uh, Armenians, uh, Turkmenians. I mean, it's, it's, it's a melting pot. The Soviet Union had no borders. So all the nation and Russian Empire had no borders per se. And that was the territory of the former Russian Empire. So lots of people from every ethnic group used to live together, intermarry, share their food, share their culture. It's a melting pot down there, sort of like United States. So, but the Ukraine currently discriminates against Russian language, even disallowing it uh, to to be taught at schools and they even disallow it on campus if you speak russian and you want to talk to your friend in russian you can do it they banned it so it's insanity and that's democratic ukraine this is democracy that pelosi and biden told us oh this is democracy ukraine is democracy we need to save democracy no it's dictatorship totalitarian dictator Zelensky. Let's listen in. I'm asking Rostislav next about Zelensky, what happened to him. Uh, let's listen in. Вступление Польши на Украину, а я, ну, честно говоря, не думаю, что его вообще удастся избежать, потому что Польша тоже достаточно ограничена в своих возможностях, и просто так вот смотреть, как от нее уплывает Галиция, польскому правительству сложно. Значит, поэтому, если вступление Польши на Украину произойдет в рамках какого-то компромисса с Россией, в рамках договоренности с Россией, he is saying that Poland will likely not miss an opportunity to somehow get involved and get into Ukraine. But Rostislav says it could be two different ways. It could get in as part of some type of agreement with Russia. I don't know. I'm adding from myself, maybe as peacekeepers. Um, or it's, if it's temporary presence of Poland in Ukraine and the part of some type of agreement with Russia, that's one thing. Then you could sort of kind of avoid the conflict if Russia and Poland have some type of a temporary arrangement or some type of arrangement where both of them agree that Polish army will uh, be stationed in uh, Western Ukraine for a period of time or something like that. Then Rostislav says it could be avoided as far as the major conflict escalation. Then you could say that this could be delayed and that people or parties could negotiate and find some type of compromise uh, if it's basically done with Russia's consent. So basically, if Poland was to be allowed to go into Ukraine as a part of some type of agreement with Russia, uh, Rostislav says, it would de-escalate things and it would buy some more time in order for the parties to find the peaceful solution and to come up with a better framework how to address this. But the major escalation would be sort of a put on a back burner for a minute until they work on some type of peaceful resolution of this conflict and would at least stop the hot phase of this war. <laughs> выскочить вот этой дурной последовательности, которая загоняет нас во все более и более жесткую конфронтацию, причем конфронтацию. And then we would have a chance to avoid this and escape this insane confrontation that pushes us further and further and deeper and deeper into this conflict. В глобальном плане. Globally, it pushes us into the global war, global conflict. Которая всем приносит только дополнительные издержки. 
This confrontation is only bringing more misery to everyone around the world and everyone involved. Rostislav says you can never win against the nuclear nation because the nuclear countries they can only play the game and tie. None of them can lose because the nuclear country has the last argument that's nuclear weapons. Который yeah. просто как ластиком стирает человечество с карты планеты, значит, и возникает всеобщая ничья, которая никого не устраивает, но э, во всяком случае, значит, позволяет проигравшему избежать поражения. He says, yes, uh, basically, um, all it does, it ties up the war into the, the, the score being zero on the scoreboard. But this way, it avoids somebody being called a, a loser. That's all it is. But he says it's a very dangerous game to play with nuclear nation because nuclear nation can tie this game up and, and make score into zero if it feels like you want to defeat it and then it's going to be the end of civilization it's very dangerous Ростислав я знаю что вы ограничены во времени тоже поэтому последний вопрос надеюсь не последний вообще надеюсь мы с вами это еще повторим в другой I am asking Ростислав and saying the last question I'm going to ask him about Zelensky now Dean, 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 everybody writes down the comments. What do you guys think about Zelensky? I'm going to ask Rostislav. I'm going to ask him, what does he think? What happened to Zelensky? Because when he ran for, uh, I was going to say for Congress, when he ran for uh, president in the Uni United States, I am losing my mind, in Ukraine. Everything begins with you, United States, Ukraine, and it's just keep losing. Um, when Zelensky ran for president of Ukraine, he basically made some campaign promises. He did sort of say that I don't want to make any promises because no promises, no expectations. But he made some very real promises when he was inaugurated. He said he wants to stop the shelling of Donbass and the war in Donbass. And with all that, he never did. The shelling of Eastern Ukraine continued. The people kept dying. They still dying to this day. Zelensky studied to ban Russian language. Now he bans Russian church. While in his interviews, when he ran for president, he always said that, oh, I think Russian language is important. He spoke Russian. His entire campaign was in Russian. And now he turned into this nationalist, into this dictator. So I'm asking Rostislav, what does he think happened to Zelensky and what will be his outcome? Is he going to go uh, for the second term? Because Zelensky also said something about not being there um, for more than one term in Ukraine. Let's see if that's a question. If not, I'll just translate as we go. For us, Zelensky. Он собирается баллотироваться в 2024 году. По-моему, он говорил, что он будет на один срок. И вопрос тоже по поводу Зеленского. Что с ним случилось? Он когда баллотировался, говорил о том, что надо прекратить войну на Донбассе, что Украина уже сколько лет до того, как он избрался в президенты, Украина бомбила восточную Украину, Донбасский регион. И он такой был, как бы вот все, надо войну прекратить, и русский язык я запрещать не буду. И, то, и вдруг такой поворот, он превратился в националиста, он превратился в диктатора, запрещает русский язык, запрещает церковь, запрещает оппозиционные каналы телевизионные, медиа, независимые медиа. Что с ним случилось? И как вы видите, 24-й год, будет ли он баллотироваться еще раз? Он говорил, что он вроде только на один срок. Как, какое, у вас, какое у вас мнение по этому поводу? Ну, по поводу того, что он говорил. Yeah, I basically ask him what he thinks about Zelensky and whether Zelensky will be uh, re-elected, whether he's going to run again in 2024. I believe that's when the next Ukraine elections are. 
And why did Zelensky turn into this dictator, basically a 360 degree turn and um, totally became an, uh, I don't know, the nemesis of his, uh, himself, his uh, campaign version of himself? Там не совсем э, понятен был смысл высказывания. То есть, то ли он президент на один срок, то ли... Good question, Alan. Why haven't Russia take him out yet? Meaning Zelensky, right? Uh, there was a pretty cool interview. I was going to find it and play it for you guys sometime. Naftali Bennett, former Israel Prime Minister, gave an interview, I believe it was a few days ago. And he said that when the war in Ukraine uh, in 2022 was a Russian army coming in, started on last February 24th. Uh, of course, we know the war in Ukraine was already going on since 2014 when Ukraine was killing its own people in Eastern Donbass. But when Russian troops came in in last years, in February of 2022, Israeli Prime Minister, former Israeli Prime Minister Bennett, Naftali Bennett, said that Zelensky called him petrified. And he said, Putin is going to kill me. Putin is going to kill me. Can you please call Putin and ask him not to kill me? I'm sitting in this bunker. In other words, Zelensky was scared to death that Putin was going to kill him. Guess what? Naftali Bennett says in his interview, former Israeli prime minister, that he called Putin and he said, could you please, you know, like, tell me, I mean, like, what are you doing? I mean, this guy is scared, meaning Zelensky, he thinks you're going to kill him. He's, he's concerned. He's afraid. Putin says, I'm not going to, Putin said, I'm not going to kill him. And so Naftali Bennett said in his interview, that the next day Zelensky showed up for a big press conference in the spotlight and he was saying, oh, I am all this strong, powerful Zelensky. Look at me. I am a star. I am like this, this hegemon of, of the entire world. You know, in other words, he lost his fear because Naftali Bennett, former Israeli prime minister, by confirming in his interview, talked to Putin, Russian president, who assured him that he will not kill Zelensky. So that's your answer, Alan. Very good question. And Ida says, Zelensky gives me the creeps. I don't like his way of speaking, don't like his voice, don't like his way of playing a hero to the world. He is an actor and he's acting well, so he fools the world. Uh, yes, he's a good actor. You are very uh, right about it. I watched an interview with his former chief of staff. Um, I believe his name was Andre Bogdan, Zelensky's uh, chief of staff. Um, I would have to say, very savvy guy. The interview was about three hours long, and there were several of interviews three hours long. I watched all of them. So that guy basically said to the interviewer, the guy who worked for Zelensky, who helped him run, who helped him get elected, Andre Bogdan, he told the land, uh, he told the interviewer that you don't think you think Zelensky is lying. No, Zelensky is not lying. In his own mind, he thinks he's not lying. He thinks he's he's acting. So basically, when we, the people who are not actors, look at him and think he's lying, in his own mind, said Andrei Bogdan, former chief of staff of Zelensky, Zelensky is just acting. So let me um, play what Rostislav, former Ukrainian diplomat uh, who lives now in Russia and works for Russia Today, a news outlet as a contributor, also geopolitical analyst, uh, says about Zelensky. Он собирался проблемы, которые стоят перед Украиной, решить в течение одного срока, но это не значит. He basically says, Rostislav says that Zelensky was so vague on his campaign trail that nobody could really understand whether he's going to um, basically be a one-term president or is he promising to solve some of the problems in one term or like what he was really saying. He's... 
It's not all that important, says Rostislav. На Украине любой президент будет баллотироваться на второй срок. Because in Ukraine, every president will certainly run a second time for the second term. Любой, потому что по грязным коррупционным деяниям. Every president of Ukraine will run for the second term because once they entrenched in corruption. Once they are the president of Ukraine, entrenched in this corruption scheme by being a president of Ukraine. Нет, он имеет только один шанс и одну возможность избежать уголовного преследования. His only opportunity to avoid being prosecuted would be to keep remaining in power and keep remaining to be a president. Нет, это сохраняться у власти по жизни. Никому еще это не удавалось. And they are trying uh, to remain in power for the lifetime. Nobody succeeded yet, says Rostislav, in Ukraine to do that. But they all are aiming for that. Ну и кроме того, когда президент, по сути дела, возглавляет одну из ну, таких полумафиозных да, структур, да, которые контролируют в коррупционном плане все государство, то он несет ответственность уже и перед этой структурой. То есть ему... And when the president becomes and became a part of this quasi-mafioso structure, and that structure is this corruption structure in Ukraine, to where president is on top, so he is sort of responsible for keeping the status quo of and protect his corrupt uh, cronies in that pyramid structure of corruption in Ukraine. Его собственные сотрудники не дадут просто взять и уйти, потому что если он просто уходит, да. So his own uh, collaborators in corruption will not just let him let him leave simply and leave them to fend for themselves because they need him to protect them. А куда тогда они придет? And if he leaves the president of Ukraine uh, entrenched in corruption schemes, if he leaves, what is going to happen to them? So they want to make sure that he stays in power to protect them, right? Уже другая команда. И уже... Because if he leaves, then he, the new president will bring his own new team. Uh, with the new president comes the new team. And the old team then, the old corruption scheme will have to disappear, and they wouldn't want that. So if the president, like Zelensky, would leave and his corruption crony collaborator structure team will be gone uh, and will have to be forced out because the new president will bring their own team Presumably, new uh, new team of uh, prospectively corrupt, corruptible people who want to instigate their own schemes. So Rostislav says that if our president has to go and does not run for the second term, his team will will understand that now they will not be the ones robbing, but they will be the ones who are now robbed by the you know by the others so they would like to remain in power so they would like to have their protector the president keep running for the second term or uh, for life if, if that could get away with that he says even though if those corrupt corrupt politicians or officials who are in cahoots now with the lansky even if they will not be prosecuted officially or legally. They could be robbed, meaning um, their assets uh, could be expropriated. Some manufactured uh, deals against them could be procured and they could be basically left without their assets, without their property and uh, basically um, raided uh, by the new team that comes with a new president что происходит его просто перераспределение в пользу новых руководителей. Yeah, it's, it's basically um, 
re what is it um, redistribution of wealth ukrainian style это вот попытка баллотироваться ну если будут на украине когда-нибудь выборы да значит безусловно of course with one caveat if ukraine is going to have elections again or not словно будет что so then if ukraine will have election elections again then Zelensky definitely will run again says uh, Rostislav касается того почему Зеленский значит выглядит так или иначе но во-первых Зеленский не обещал ничего из того что ему приписывают Зеленский he says that the reason Zelensky is what Zelensky is that he didn't really make promises that people attribute to him to that same extent everybody pretty much heard what they wanted to hear when Zelensky was running because his campaign was um, so uh, masterfully and skillfully made into this vague campaign which anybody could read into whatever that they wanted to hear into, into his words or read into him. They gave very abstract and very un... Uh, un unidentifiable and um, non-solid so to speak promises that uh, basically were very um, etheric you could stretch them any way that you want you stretch your imagination the way it fits your uh, your own agenda те, кто хотел мира и нормальных взаимоотношений с Россией, слышали, что Зеленский говорит, что да, можно моментально заключить мир, главное только перестать. Everybody who wanted peace and wanted to, to stop shelling Donbass and peace with Russia, they saw him as a savior and they read into his words as if he is willing to do that. And we're going to have peace if he is the president. Те, кто хотели победы в Донбассе, слышали, что Зеленский говорит, так мир надо заключать на украинских условиях. The other ones who wanted to win over the eastern provinces and uh, basically uh, return Donbass under Ukraine's jurisdiction, they felt that this peace with Donbass will be uh, firmly on Ukrainian conditions, not uh, favorable to Donbass or to Russia conditions. So the victory in Donbass could have meant different things to different, uh, basically, groups of Ukrainians. And that was uh, the, the mastery of Zelensky, the, the vagueness uh, with which everybody could read pretty much anything they wanted into his campaign. And uh, he obviously didn't deliver on any, on any of those. It's a of DNR LNR. It's a and so These were Ukrainian conditions. And Ukraine, of course, wanted to completely destroy Donbass. They wanted Donbass militia. They wanted to win the war against eastern uh, provinces in Donbass and destroy those militias and uh, take back that territory. So uh, people who believed that that's what peace in Ukraine would look like, they thought that that's what they're voting now uh, when they uh, wanted Zelensky to win. Значит, поэтому э, э, компания Зеленского избирательная была построена достаточно грамотно э, с той точки зрения, что его обещания были настолько э, всеохватные и неопределенные, что значительная часть населения, даже люди противоположных взглядов, считали, что Зеленский обещает именно то, что они хотят in uh, Rostislav's assessment, Zelensky's campaign was so vague that even people with polar opposite views uh, somehow thought that he would answer both of their um, uh, to both of their concerns. Uh, so it was vague enough to where um, I've talked to many Ukrainian people, and uh, some of them actually say that some of them voted for Zelensky not even because they voted for what he offered it's just they wanted to vote against the guy who was running against Zelensky Poroshenko who was already Ukrainian president under whom Ukraine continuously bombed eastern provinces so people believe that Zelensky is like a savior when he comes back basically talking about peace and the peace will be achieved 
But look what happened. Even bigger war, even more devastated war, more victims, more deaths of Ukrainians. Yeah, so Zelensky is really a um, nightmare for Ukraine. What do you guys think about Zelensky? Type in some comments and type what countries you're watching from. I've already mentioned, says Rostislav, that Ukraine resembles the Latin American dictatorship style uh, a government of the last decades of 21st century. With uh, minute uh, peculiarities, its own uh, distinguishable features. Думаю, настолько тупых, жестоких и коррупционных диктатур не было даже в Латинской Америке. I don't even think that in, uh, there were such harsh, blunt and uh, bloody dictatorship. I don't think they even existed in Latin America as they are now in Ukraine. In other words, Ukraine is worse, worse than. А как вы помните, в принципе, Соединенным Штатам, которые контролируют латиноамериканские диктатуры, было абсолютно наплевать приходит к власти политик под левыми лозунгами, под правыми лозунгами. And the United States really did not care about um, anybody who comes to power, whether he is uh, the figure from the right or whether the figure from the left. As soon as he will be promoting the policy of the United States. Не угодно лозунгами. Главное, чтобы он выполнял указания Соединенных Штатов. Он может быть правым. Но если он пытается отстаивать национальные интересы, то его выгонят или убьют. Значит, он может быть левым, но если он сотрудничает с Соединенными Штатами, он будет считаться демократом и так далее. А если он не будет сотрудничать с Соединенными Штатами, он будет считаться марксистом, революционером, значит, врагом цивилизации. Basically, he says a poli politician in Ukraine can come from the left, but if he cooperates with United States and promotes United States policies in Ukraine, then he will be considered democracy fighter. But if he's from the left and uh, if he is not supporting United States policies, then they're going to blame and call him Marxist and uh, a criminal and a communist or something like that. In other words, United States, according to Rostislav, doesn't care from whether the politician comes from the left or from the right. As soon as they can use him, they will always rebrand them as they needed to sell it to Ukrainian or American people as a freedom fighter or whatever, even though we know, um, now I'm adding from myself, Zelensky is not a freedom fighter. He's a totalitarian dictator. But we are presented here in the United States as if he's a democratic leader of the free world, free Ukraine, free Europe, oh, and scares Europe with Russia, aggressor, and he's just such a peace-loving, uh, nice little uh, sheep, basically wolf in a sheep's clothing. That's what Zelensky become. That's tragic for Ukrainian people, what he did to them. Соединенные Штаты не для того производили государственный переворот и брали страну под контроль, чтобы какой-то Зеленский там что-то решал. Ростислав says, United States did not change regime in Ukraine and uh, completed the coup, unconstitutional coup d'etat that removed the democratically elected president of Ukraine in 2014 in order to put the politician in power that would actually be self-sufficient uh, and make his own decision. No, they want a puppet. Он может просто ретранслировать указания из Вашингтона. Он может их каким-то образом интерпретировать. Но даже Порошенко, который их слишком вольно интерпретировал, и который таки не втянулся в войну, как его в это не толкали Соединенные Штаты, но Порошенко войну с Россией, в отличие от Зеленского, не начал. И Порош... Ростислав is saying that the guy against whom Zelensky was running for the presidency uh, uh, who was the president in Ukraine in 2019 was Poroshenko. But Rostislav says even Poroshenko, um, apparently by being very malleable by United States and uh, always referring to Biden, oh, hello, Mr. Biden, my friend, uh, and basically was puppeteered by United States, 
But Rostislav says even that president, Poroshenko, did not start the war with Russia, per se, did not push it that far, as bad as he was. So, but he's saying that United States needed somebody even more pliable, even more manageable puppet, and they found it, and that's uh, Zelensky, apparently. Poroshenko didn't allow the United States to take the position of the premier of his человека. He took the position of his bill. And he's, uh, Rostislav says that Poroshenko, uh, years back when he was the president, didn't allow United States to put their own person, like their controlled person, on the position in government of Ukraine after Poroshenko removed Yatsenyuk, one of the uh, government officials. So in other words, Poroshenko, previous president before Zelensky, even though he was a puppet, he seemed to have at least tried to um, sometimes act in, in, uh, in his own ways, um, you know, in little, little tiny things. But that wasn't good enough. United States uh, says Rostislav wanted complete, a complete um, a surrender of Ukraine to United States uh, uh, orders. Somebody who takes orders completely without even slight inclination of uh, of variable outcome, in other words, complete puppet, and that seems like that's what Zelensky uh, is for them. He says. И дальше не дал провести ни одну американскую клиатуру на эту должность. Так вот даже Порошенко, несмотря на то, что в целом проводил про американскую политику, и с Россией отнюдь не дружил. Значит, даже and he says even Poroshenko, the previous president before Zelensky, he wasn't really friends with Russia. He really uh, didn't uh, proclaim pro-Russian policies, but um, he tried to play his own game on the background as well and not allow some of the American installed puppets into his own government. But, uh, you know, he was not uh, malleable enough. They uh, wanted Zelensky uh, type figure who would not have to think who would just blindly uh, do what is told. So Americans didn't want Poroshenko to, to be elected for the second term. Uh, they wanted to have somebody even more manageable than Poroshenko, the one before Zelensky. So the Poroshenko was not re-elected for the second term and Zelensky was elected. Именно таким управляемым человеком. Совершенно управляемым человеком. Зеленский is completely controlled, totally managed. Без какого бы то ни было опыта в политике. He had no experience in politics. Что с гигантскими амбициями. But he had giant ambitions. Поэтому ему просто выдали треугольку Бонапарта. So they simply gave him the head of Napoleon Bonaparte. And they said, you will be the winner over Russia. And we will help you. Go fight. And he happily obliged and ran to start fighting Russia and to win over Russia, quote-unquote. Hopeful, hoping that the West is going to help him and the West is going to save him. But now Zelensky is hysterical because he's in panic mode, because he sees that the Western quote-unquote help and weapons do not come in time. They do not arrive on time. They come in smaller quantities than expected or promised. And those weapons do not solve Ukraine's problems. They only push in Ukraine further deeper into problems. And there is new and new problems are created uh, during this whole process for Zelensky and for Ukraine. Uh, Rostislav says, as... Uh, with even his intellect, he is capable to see the end. 
And he can uh, probably assess the situation and dynamics of where this is all going. He can probably uh, assess how soon the end will be and what the end would look like for for Ukraine and for him. He says Zelensky now is not um, basically debating or contemplating whether Ukrainian state will survive this war, but whether, where and where he should escape to. That's what is on his mind. And will he be able to escape before it totally collapses, the Ukrainian state? And if he is escaping, then where? And how will be he received wherever he is going to be escaping to from Ukraine? And of course, this is not inspiring for Zelensky. And of course, that doesn't inspire Zelensky to, uh, you know, keep going or to make some new... Uh, new great victories out there so this is me and rostislav and uh, that's our interview i hope you guys enjoyed it благодарю вас ростислав спасибо вам большое за то что сегодня вы приняли участие в этой дискуссии надеюсь мы это сделаем еще раз конечно с удовольствием you see it was a great discussion i think that was a great interview okay anybody still left out there type some comments let's see now we'll go back to your comments Let's see, guys, what are you up to? Great interview with Rostislav Ishenko. Me and Rostislav are talking about Ukraine. And any comments that I missed or if anybody is still watching, type where you're watching from, welcome to our little interview today. Let me get to everybody's comments, see who I missed real quick here. Um, I have, hello, hello, Copenhagen, I have that, Alaska, we have Denmark, New York, Sweden, Australia, Mozambique, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Ireland, Prague, Oklahoma, Italy, Atlanta, USA, Brisbane, um, did I have Brisbane again? Sierra Leone watching from Germany, Holland, excellent. Let's see, guys. Beautiful big Irish hello. We have Austria, Germany again, Arizona, United States. I hope I, I got it. Yes, I did. Um, let me see. President Biden, I think I played some of these comments. California, shared to the world. America is corrupt. Yep, great comment, Mikey. Great comment. Biden and his administration are war criminals, eco terrorism, said Howard. We have somebody watching Cora from Philippines. Excellent. And we have, um, let me see, Cora, exactly, William saying we need to call a ceasefire and the truth. Thank you for speaking out and spreading the truth. Great, you asked the leader of uh, war, what is it, pig government? I Maybe I, I need my glasses for that one. Thank you for the, all the information, says Brenda Edwards, excellent. Rhode Ireland, USA watching, perfect. Williams, another comment. Watching from Zambia, Central Africa, welcome. We got it. Excellent. Hello from Netherlands. Um, who do we have? Let me see. Zelensky is a uh, mafia bandits and West are destroying and holding Ukrainian people hostage. 
Yeah, very true, very too awkward. The Ukrainian people are definitely hostages to corrupt politicians in Ukraine and United States and in EU also. Uh, Sahid said, Viva Putin, Viva Russian forces and Wagner. I'm watching from Sudan. Welcome. Thank you for watching from Sudan. Excellent. Guys, guys, we have all kinds of guys watching with us and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, right? Um, which one in uh, 2014? William Garrison, we have commented. Watching from Stavanger, Norway. Welcome, Norway. Excellent. David Bentley gives me a compliment. Thank you, David. You are the best, Elena Oki for Congress. Thank you. That's my Facebook page. Um, see who else we have. We have hello from Moskva. Maria Vyanovich, Moskva. I'm wondering if that Moskva means Moscow or what country Moscow? Because you know, there is Moscow in Russia, but there is also Moscow in the United States. I'm sure there's a couple of other countries in the world who have Moscow as a city. So, Maria, you have to tell us what Moscow you are watching from. Stephanie LaBelle said, USA is paying the price. The worst ecological artificial accident. Yep, that's uh, about that's about all the problems that we have with ecology. Uh, Marianne says Ukraine is, oi, I, my German is not really all that good to say. Varsel Stad der USA. Basically, she's saying that Ukraine is a vassal state to the United States. And um, yeah, and, and, and Zelensky sold his land and his people. That's how I read it, Marianne. Thanks for the, your comment in German. Multiple corrupt organizations and groups. Yep. Linda says, why is Dow Jones is still in, in the red? Well, because we're in recession. Uh, Biden keeps lying to us that uh, we're nice and well. Our economy is struggling and it's been struggling, I mean, for this entire year and years before. Remember, we had Biden as our president for how many years now? I was surprised that our economy is struggling. No, not at all. They want to destroy us. That's what they do best. They keep printing money. They they spend like it's out is going out of style. And the next thing you know, we have inflation. They waste billions of our taxpayer dollars on their crony operations and money laundromat in Ukraine. This corrupt politician sold us out. And then our economy is basically down the tubes and they could care less. They don't care. We have cheap monks saying greetings from Sweden. Um, who we have here? Zelensky is a puppet, says Richard Schultz. Um, yeah, all this is going for uh, generations. You should look who has their hand in a proverbial cookie jar, but like a puppeteer that's not seen who has their hand in every country's politics during the 1920s, 1929, I believe, when Mussolini gave back the state status to the Roman Catholic Church and gave it the state status back, they gave them $90 million in, good, uh, in gold, I'm sorry, as reparations they held onto that gold. And mysteriously, six months later, the Great Depression of America happened and they but I, I don't see your entire comment. Maybe there is more. But yeah, uh, we do know that um, the Vatican has been basically established as uh, uh, during World War II. And uh, yeah, they got their in independence and they, the ambassadors were given money to establish the um, embassy uh, to various countries because now they became independent state. Yeah, and by the way, recently I read that um, uh, Sophia Loren, actually some of her relatives, um, I'm not sure through marriage possibly, um, were descendants of Benito Mussolini. Yep, it's a small world, guys. Check it out. Check Sophia Loren's bio. Yeah, her, uh, she got related, I think, through marriage to Benito Mussolini crowd. And Benito Mussolini 
ancestors, his granddaughter, and they are pretty much involved in Italian politics right now. So, yeah. Sweden, we have I Ida here watching in Spain. And Edie is watching from Sweden. Excellent. Oceanside, California. Who is there at the Oceanside? Michael, you make us jealous. But I can't complain. I'm looking over Lake Michigan. It's gorgeous here. But it's cold. I hope you have it warmer there. We have Ireland here again. We have Aloha there. Aloha is Hawaiian greeting. Norway, Jan Tor, welcome. Uh, okay, Michael says, can someone help me get political asylum, asylum in Russia? Oh, wow, Michael. What are you running from? Um, by the way, ask Snowden. He has uh, a political asylum, asylum in Russia, and he, I believe, received Russian citizenship now as well. But um, yeah, you better check, I don't know, Russian embassy or something. Uh, good question, but I hope you didn't do anything uh, that would make you uh, want to, to look for the asylum, unless this was a joke. Um, Jeff Manson, uh, American uh, MMA, uh, mixed martial arts champion, and he was American citizen, and then he got Russian passport, so he became a Russian dual citizen. And then yesterday, I read an article in RT, I believe, that he decided to give up his American citizenship, and he's just now going to only keep his Russian citizenship. Edi says, good job. Ukraine is uh, washing dirty money for the criminals in Washington. Exactly right, Luz. Remember the FTX scandal? Google it up, guys. FTX. And Sam Bankman Freed, Ukraine, cryptocurrency, United States money, Congress, Biden, Democrats, donations, elections. Yeah, check all of that out. I've talked about it before. Uh, New Zealand, we have another Norway. Excellent. Excellent. Nice. And we have Slovenia. We have Maine. We have Philippines. Oh my gosh, a lot of wonderful friends here that are watching. Good job. Everything you said is true. I believe it. I see it in my own country. They blame Putin for everything. Wow, I know this is not true. It's all the US and Europe, and we're paying for the consequences. Daniel says, New York states of America way up north in the mountain. Well, wow, you should send us some pictures. It sounds very beautiful. Sounds gorgeous. I'm watching you from Ghana. Good job. Welcome. Mohammed from Chicago. Christine from Australia. Ileana from New Zealand is watching us. Medi is reminding everybody put like button. Everybody do that. See, we have another New Zealand. Welcome. We have Ricky, United States. Um, we have Alan's commenting. Can't we just all get alone? <laughs> Medi says NATO has been a paper tiger since the 90s. They hid behind the skirts of the United States nuclear arsenal to cover up the real weakness each NATO country had militarily. They know they are losing. Interesting, interesting. Great comment, Mary. Bill Tara says, will Russia and China go after Norway for their involvement into uh, Nord Stream bombings? It sounds like I've answered this early in the stream that Putin's already, I think, looking uh, uh, for UN investigation or calling for UN investigation into Nord Stream. Uh, and we know that same Hirsch, the uh, American journalist who actually wrote the article, who is behind you know, the Nord Stream and uh, suggesting that Biden's direct orders were involved in this whole sabotage, it included Normie and included Americans and, Ameri and, and soldiers on both sides and the SEALs. Of, I mean, really, it's, it's, a, it's a very labor-intensive thing to blow up billions of dollars worth of infrastructure in the sea, which is surveyed by NATO from satellites, from everywhere. And nobody knows who done it? Yeah, right. 
So, but yeah, I think Putin is trying to call for you and we'll see what Putin is going to say. He's going to deliver a big speech on Tuesday, uh, February 21st. And then on February 22nd, I believe Russia's Security Council is going to meet. So whatever Putin is going to say, Russian president, on Tuesday next week, then um, they will have to respond to on Wednesday. And sounds like Biden's going to be in Europe during that same time in Poland. I mean, don't quote me on that, but check the dates. Um, we have Mohammed saying we need to remove all military organizations and bases from the world and build more businesses, hospitals, shelters, etc., to bring peace. Good point, Mohammed. Good point. We we feel like we're all hostages to the warmongering, corrupt politicians that uh, only want us to fight each other. By the way, that interview that I just translated, that's what Rostislav, former Ukrainian diplomat who lives in Russia now, said. He says that what uh, America is doing to Ukraine is not even in the interest of the people of America. It's just basically in the interest of the few politicians in, in those in a democratic win and some, obviously, my thoughts, some Republicans, but mostly Democrats. He said Biden, Obama, I believe he mentioned, and um, uh, who else? And Clinton, he mentioned, that they don't have anything viable to offer American um people in terms of how to prosper america they have no suggestions they don't have any plan so the war is their only plan to make it look like oh look we have a war let's create some quick you know weapons here oh look we are doing great here in america now look we got people employed you know i don't know these people have no viable economic plan so the war um, and war and war and war is the answer to all the problems. And that's the only thing it does, kills more people around the world, enriches them, but does not solve American economical problems. That's why earlier comments said, why is Dow Jones still in the red? Well, that's why, because what they're doing is not answering the real problems of America. They're just distracting us, us from them with their war in Ukraine that they've started with uh, Putin, they want to fight Russia. Good luck, Biden. You and your bunker can go fight who you want. We don't have bunkers here. We're not going to survive the nuclear blast if Russia decides to nuke us all. Um, I got Mehdi's comment before. We have Mohammed's um, comments. Netherlands is one of those two countries that we, I got that comment before. Old men create wars and young people die. That's true. We have Australia, New Zealand. Let's see. USA, Canada, excellent South Africa. Oh, my gosh. We have so many wonderful watches here. I love you all, guys. Thank you very much. I'm trying to play all of your comments here and make sure I didn't forget anybody. And we have, again, Latina from France. And we have Max. Excellent. Vancouver, Canada. We have Ben Taher watching from Libya. Welcome. Excellent. More comments. Excellent. I cannot see, Medju, was it U.S.? Was that USA flag? Um, I guess my emojis don't... Uh, uh, don't translate the same way. Daniel says, I hope Russia destroys NATO. I'm afraid NATO is going to destroy itself because if you start attacking your NATO allies and blow up the infrastructures, billion dollars worth, and then you sweep it under the rug like, no big deal. Ah, it, it's all Russia's fault anyway. It's all Putin's fault, right? Then um, maybe those uh, people will wake up one day. And say, hey, we don't need uh, we don't need Biden uh, to destroy our infrastructure and uh, basically keep smiling to us like he's our friend. Maybe they'll wake up one day, but who knows? They may never wake up. That's also a possibility. Have another one. A comment praying for peace. Actual excellent. Um we have here some more comments, some more comments. Gosh, 
a lot of these wonderful comments, guys. I'm trying to play, play every one of your comments, and I'm missing uh, some, but I know I've already played them before, so I'm not really missing. Ida says, thank you, very enlightening. And we have Janine. Oh, Eugene, Russia, Rostov on Don, excellent. I like it. Thank you very much. The piece, I just get handshake away. Love from West Coast, Norway. Yes, Kyle, the piece is the handshake away. You know what they say that uh, all the wars eventually end uh, with the, uh, with at the negotiating table? That's exactly true. That's where the all wars usually end. Well, guys, I think I read all of your comments. Um, I want to thank you all for your patience. I want to thank Rostislav Vyshenko for giving me the opportunity to have that interview with him and translate it for you. I know it took a long time. Thank you all for your patience, for your comments, for your likes. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, Elena USA Live, Elena Live USA. I have two channels. Make sure you follow me on Facebook. Uh, wherever I'm else at, I will tell you later in my other platforms. And I hope to see you guys again. We'll do it again. We'll do another live show and uh, we'll do some more interviews. So subscribe, click bell, make sure next time I go live or post a video, you are notified and we're together. And you guys can keep commenting and supporting and uh, having a great time. And hopefully we all can learn, right? And we, of course, pray for peace in the world. Um, we pray for uh, the politicians to come to their senses and not to subject us to the potential of nuclear war with Russia, because that would be the end of civilization, as Rostislav Ishenko said today on the interview I translated for you. Uh, he is a Ukrainian diplomat, former Ukrainian diplomat, and I hope this was helpful and enlightening. And uh, we'll see if maybe we can do it again with Rostislav Ishenko and ask him a few more questions again. So subscribe, keep, watch, share with friends. And, uh, and uh, basically, guys, keep in touch by uh, being on my lives. And uh, I love all of your comments. Thank you very much, everybody who commented today. My big hugs to you. And I uh, hope to see you guys next again. Have a great uh, Friday. Enjoy yourself. Have a big smile. If you're in the cold climate like me, have a warm cup of tea or coffee or whatever your favorite beverage and uh, crawl up under some good covers. Watch a great movie uh, in the evening. Enjoy yourself. Be safe. I love you and I will see you next time.